reconvening from the shade meeting. I'll take a motion without second. Okay. Thank you. Please vote. Four nays, four to one in favor of the motion. We'll adjourn for a second on the, on the, to reset. The, the pew, yeah. Good evening, this is the June 3rd Gary Sensing Public Forum. Please turn your cell phone to the vibrate, silence, or off setting. The Gary Sensing Public Forum is intended for matters not included on the agenda for the upcoming Board of County Commissioners meeting. Citizens wishing to address items on the agenda should sign up to speak to such item at the regular Board of County Commissioners meeting. Speakers shall refrain from abusive or profane remarks, disruptive outbursts, protests, or other conduct which interferes with the orderly conduct of the Gary Sensing Public Forum. Each speaker is limited to three minutes, uh, unless otherwise determined by the chairman to allow sufficient time for all speakers. Uh, we have three, six, we have 10. Okay, Michael Lowry. Good evening, commissioners. Um, Mike Lowry, 4302 Yarmouth Place. Uh, commissioners, I want to first start off by saying that in the last couple of weeks, I've had some positive meetings, very positive meetings with the management team, on-site management team at ECAT, meaning Ms. Ellis and Mr. Kimbrell. We have worked together and have communicated well, but it comes across often that their hands are tied. Every time they want to do something right and work with the union and work to make morale better on the site and work to work on some goals, it's always blocked when it's brought downtown through the administration, HR, I don't know. I want you to know a few facts. I hope you realize that your transit system is down of almost 20 bus operators now. Last, this past week, you've lost three more employees at ECAT that resigned and walked away. That's con that should be very concerning. You've lost maintenance employees, you've lost bus operators, you only got, you've lost a third of your bus operators trying to maintain a full service. So you're paying overtime. You can't find operators to come here because you have Mr. Kimbrough who has a plan to, to offer a CDL, but he can't implement it. There is problems at your transit facility. The driver break room, there's no ceilings. They, they're, they're damaged. There's water that leaks into the driver break room. There's, the building is bad. I was there today. I physically watched on the property individuals that are loitering, that are, shouldn't be there. I watched activity, drug activity on the facility happening on a county facility. Not county employees, but people coming to that facility. We need security on that property. We need to protect those citizens who want to ride the transit system safely. They have to be safe. Otherwise, they're gonna make them figure out to do something else. That's, that's a reflection on you, commissioners, as well as the individuals that work there. I can tell you the employees don't like it. They want a better service. We need you, come down. We invite every one of you to come down and walk the facility yourself. Don't get the fluff, get reality. Don't get the fluff, get reality. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just uh, housekeeping items, uh, Mr. Bennett, Mr. Davis, and Mr. McRae, your, your items on the agenda. Um, so we would, we would hold these until the agenda item. Okay. We'll, we'll transfer them over. 
Uh, Jerry Bell. Good evening, commissioners. About a month ago, I was here. My name is Jerry Bell, which you did call. And I'm coming in as a concerned citizen. It has gotten worse at ECAT. That was the place that I got employed at in 1998 and saw big changes, things being done for the betterment. Now I hear about the break room when I was personally instrumental in getting that done. Now it's tore up again. What, what's going on? I get a phone call last night, Gwen McCormick got COVID while working because no one took care of the drivers that had to drive those buses in the height of COVID. Matter of fact, the union president was fired for trying to get folks' attention of what was going on. You fired a man that was trying to protect the workers, the president of the union. I certainly wish I was still there. Then you have Maureen, who was terminated last year because she went to her only child's wedding, who did the right thing and asked for a change of date for her vacation. They choose their vacations in December. The wedding was set according to her chosen vacation. Because of the COVID, the vineyard canceled. She did the right thing. She let them know. They didn't approve it. What are you going to do? Your only child's getting married and you're spending all this money? But it's OK that one of yours can go to her son's wedding. Did she get fired because she went to her son's wedding? I think not. This is ridiculous. And to say make matters worse, my friend still got the COVID. Go to the, hot, the prescriptions for last night. Can't get them filled because she's in limbo. You're supposed to have something on the table to protect her. She can't get her prescription because her insurance is canceled. Do you think that's fair, commissioners? I mean, wh what are you guys doing? I mean, you, we're taxpayers. We pay your salaries, by the way. And I think these are concerned people that are coming in here to, speaking up for ECAT. It's really sad. When I pass by there, I'm sad because that's not the place that I used to work. I know Tanya Ellis. I've known her for a long time. And I'm not going to put all that blame on her. I won't do that. A lot of the things that has transpired there is because of what's going on here. And if you're not going to lead her down the right path to do the right thing and keep blocking her, she'll never be effective or do the job properly. The leadership here is poor, to say the least. When are you going to do something about the situations? Gwen McCormick, Maureen, Mike Laurie. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. And, and, and literally, when I walked into the meeting, I was just on the phone with Mark Faulkner. I think we, we do have an uh, agreement to come back in two weeks. But I have been in with the civil rights leadership, and it really doesn't have anything to do with the bond. Uh, and I know I've been in a meeting with Mr. Bennett all day. Uh, and I would ask that they be allowed to speak because I am going to move to drop that item uh, today. And I, I think that uh, Baptist leadership is uh, in agreement with me. Uh, I can uh, officially say that from Mark. But I, I think that the concerns that I heard from uh, the community in a round table today is not the bond issue. Okay, I'm just going off of what was put on the paper. Yeah, I think they might have misread it, but I, I think it's more relocation than bond. So I think if you listen to them, it probably would not be. Uh, All right, well, I'll add him back and uh, we'll get to him in a little bit. Uh, Gwen McCormick. Mr. Chairman, while, she's come, while they're coming up, yes. um, I would support uh, what Commissioner May just said. If we are intending to drop that, there's no sense in them having to wait to speak until the, we, until we drop the item. So we okay. can take it now and they can go ahead and go okay. on. Okay, thank you. Hello, my name is Gwen McCormick. I'm back again. I'm caught, uh, back here because I'm concerned about my health insurance. Now, I was told that I would have COBRA insurance, 
so I can continue trying to get better so I can get back to work. <clears throat> I went to the pharmacy yesterday to get my prescription. They said my insurance was canceled. So I need to know what's going on with that. <clears throat> and I just heard today from uh, Robert Ellis. He was ratting on, on, on about my insurance was okay. But when I told him <clears throat> that my insurance had been canceled, then it was another tune. He said he had to talk to someone else about it. <clears throat> so I need to find out what you guys can help me with or do something. Because I still got a little <clears throat> road to go. But I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Gwen, thank you for being here, Ms. Sherman. Tanya, has, damn, has staff not been meeting with Ms. McCormick? I thought that that was the direction to meet with her to find some type of resolution. Uh, I yes. I think Jan is in the back, and I'd like for her to come forward because she says she knows what happened with the insurance. Well, so, she didn't have to come forward here. Just if She would just meet with Ms. McCormick yeah. and, and, and resolve it. I mean, that was a directive from the dais uh, to find resolution for her. Okay. Well, uh, Janet, will you make sure that you meet with Mrs. McCormick? Yes, I think that was Ms. McCormick, why she did speak with Robert Come, come to the okay. mic, please. <coughs> so we, we have met with Ms. McCormick and Mr. Lowry uh, twice. We did do um, an informal settle settlement. It was a recorded meeting as well, so they have the record of what was discussed in that meeting um, as, as to what she was speaking to. There was a system error on the uh, part of Blue Cross Blue Shield. As soon as we were made aware of it, the provider was contacted. Ms. McCormick does have full insurance. We oh, remain okay. fully insured. Okay. And um, Robert will be following up with you again tomorrow to make sure that, to check on you and, and let you know there's no action you need to take at this point. Okay. So I do apologize for that. Okay. Because I had to hear. I had right, the council yeah. appointment today because I didn't have an issue. Yeah, I don't want, I, that's unfair to have. Could you just meet with her in private, please? Yes. And if there's no resolution, Ms. McCormick, please ring back. I and mean, we can discuss our personal stuff mm -hmm. publicly. Okay. Mm -hmm. Diane Harrison. Good afternoon. I'm Diane Harrison, 1716 Martin Luther King Drive. And I'm here speaking on behalf of my sister that I'm very concerned about. Her health, nothing has been done. There hasn't been a settlement regarding her situation. She was trying to get some medication, which she truly needs for her breathing, and was told that her insurance had been canceled. You just heard that. She had an appointment today. She had to cancel that appointment. I am deeply concerned what is going on here. Something needs to be done. This is by no fault of hers. This is due to COVID, due to the negligence of ECAT and trying to, and they're putting in place those uh, precautionary measures that are needed to protect their employee. I am very concerned about that and I hopefully and prayerfully that this will be taken care of as soon as possible and that should be done today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And David, would you please put your you know, fingers on that? Uh, I know she had COVID and she's on, on oxygen and 25 year employee and um, it was my hope that there was resolution, but would you please follow up and, and report back personally? Thanks, Debbie. Okay. Melissa Pino. Thank you, Chairman Bender. Melissa Pino, 413 Southeast Poblets. We have it again. How long are you gentlemen gonna rest content with having directors stand here and boldface lie to you like that? It happens over and over. 
There is no settlement on that. How much more black and white can anybody make it? There hasn't been a settlement on it. Oh, problem with the insurance. Oh, it's a problem with the error in the system. How long are you gonna keep accepting these excuses? Because they're lies, is what they are. And I, it astonishes me that they continue to run this program as more and more people are aware that these things are lies. And yet, apparently, they don't know what else to do because they just keep lying. EMS, I was really, really happy to hear the, the remarks of the new uh, EMS chief today, and I'm blanking on his last name. I apologize, I know his first name is David. He seemed very well-spoken, very sincere. He seems to understand what the challenges are. I, I doubt he recognizes everything fully yet. He hasn't been here that long. But I handed you gentlemen a list of about a dozen questions the last time. I wonder if anybody looked into any of them. In particular, the one about the employee of the month who failed the marijuana test and, and got rewarded for it with employee of the month, particularly because Dr. Edler mentions marijuana in her suit against you guys. Then there's the question that the person that actually uh, took over the position of the AHA records got caught on certification stuff and didn't get a DOH complaint against him just like the two gentlemen who reported to Doug Underhill during the fake clemency period did not. And I'm gonna be doing my best to raise awareness on how some of these people have been railroaded and perhaps the events of the, le the last week will open people's mind to the possibility that what I've been saying about them being railroaded is true. Because if administration will perpetrate what they did this past week, what will they not do? And my answer is, there isn't anything that they won't do. I'm also glad to hear that there is medic training. Um, one last thing, for any of you out there that are watching Escambia Citizens Watch, you have to understand it's a propaganda site. It's a disinformation site. Just today, Ms. Rogers is claiming that Commissioner Underhill isn't gonna take the benefit. Of course he's not, because he's not eligible for it. Everybody knows this. And she's also claiming I don't want people coming to public forum and that I don't want her putting the call outs on holding calls. Everyone heard me stick up for her two meetings ago. Commissioner Underhill made fun of her. Oh, you can't just say holding calls, holding calls. I called him out on it and I stuck up for her. You all heard that. So people need to stop buying what they're shoveling over there. Thank you. Thank you. Kevin Wade. Kevin Wade, 413 Southeast Boblets. Oh, thank you for the questions after the DPZ presentation today and several other things. Uh, some of your questions, Commissioner Barry and Commissioner Bergosh um, and Mr. May really brought out that it looks like there's a lot of making it up as you go in the county now and new directors, really. We know, we know the chief hirer who moved to the city recently, who so many of the staff that I've been uh, close to and spoken with, they all say that one person hired them and they hired decades ago and there's so much staff and just amazing, amazing people doing great things. Um, some of them make it up as you go. They don't really do that. Those are the people who knew the playbook and followed the playbook and they weren't making it up as they went. Some DPZ stuffs um, and the entire presentation really does look a lot like you got a plan, but a lot of it's going to be made up as you go. And I think the county's really going to profit well from the uh, OLF-8. Uh, so much of the make it up as you go from some of the directors hired recently um, and the administrator don't play well. And, you know, 
I kind of applaud or expected maybe the uh, vote the way it was after the shade meeting tonight. Just plan, just plan exactly as we expected, right? Yeah. Um, there was a lot of make it up easy go that have cost some citizens dearly, have cost EMS workers dearly. And uh, I really wish there had been a little more make it up as you go with protecting the ECAT workers. Um, same thing, you know, I know we have a portion of the county that definitely wants public transportation gone. I know the rest of you have districts that will continue to thrive from public transportation. I really hope some of the money that comes from OLF8 goes smack into bringing Escambia County's public transportation up to a world-class level. It can be done and bring back the trolleys and get rid of those who are causing these little bits of drama. You know, we Thank had a chance Kevin. to take care of our people who were taking care of people. And Thank I know you, it ain't you, it's the people you oversee. Jacqueline Rogers. Good evening, Jacqueline Rogers, 1420 Ridgeway. Um, I'm here to speak to you guys about public safety. Uh, I, I want to know why it's acceptable to be paying for the last 21 years the same starting salary for our firefighters when we, I know it's a state rule, but you guys are getting 49% of your salary contributed to by the county. There are 18 open firefighter positions. They'll tell you that there's two because they have a bunch of cadets, but the cadets are not certified. I had to pay 50 some dollars, 52, $53 for reports for non-jurisdictional response for Beulah 2 station because Commissioner uh, Burgosh said we need uh, a, a day crew there. So I wanted to know, well, what are the stats? The stats that you guys don't even have, so someone had to create Someone, of course, with a $25 and $27 an hour position had to create these. That tells me you don't even own these stats. You don't even take stats on how many times they couldn't respond. But the stats that they gave me showed that, let me see how many times it was. Uh, <coughs> Station two, 176 calls were non-jurisdictional response. That means another fire station showed up. I don't know if these stats are good. These are the stats I paid for and got from the county. Molino, 209. I got it here. These are times where, it, here's one, engine one arrived um, with like two certified, only two certified and a trainee. Sometimes it's in, uh, other engines, engine three, engine four. You're paying 1079 and that includes holiday pay that is bundled into their uh, hourly wage. You're paying EMS something like $19.19 for the paramedics, $14, $14 something for EMTs. You wonder why there's 90 minute waits, and there are, I'm listening. People are talking, staff are telling me how long. Firefighters know how long they're waiting for a transport. 90 minute wait, 45 minute wait for someone who wasn't breathing, was revived, just these, all these things are happening but we're worried about a, a retirement settlement. I'll, I'll talk about that later. There is no longevity pay. So what we're doing is we're getting these new cadets in to fill these um, positions. We have, we're losing the experience because we have no longevity pay. We have no step increases. The My Government System Online too, I wanna tell you, is awful. So if that's what you're relying on, um, I did hear the discussion this morning, and it was a red herring. There was nothing posted on Scambia Citizens Watch that was uh, with social security numbers. They were all blacked out from the, everything that was posted on there. I don't know if there was something else. My question to you is how many times, and I'm finishing, are we gonna have no response for EMS for 30 minutes, 
45 minutes, they will send out a truck and say, oh, a paramedic arrived. But the statistics are wrong because they are rescheduling calls and they're sending out the, the trucks. Thank you, Jacqueline. Thank you. Karen Smith. Mel, he went over like 20 seconds, just like she did. Yes, he did. What are you saying? I mean, go ahead. Good afternoon. Uh, my name's Karen sorry, Smith. Right. Mel, I didn't, I didn't call you off. You, you stepped away. God. Go ahead, Karen, I'm sorry. Sorry, that's okay. Uh, my name's Karen Smith and I'm a nurse at Escambia County Jail. Um, I have been a nurse for 23 years. Um, three years in corrections, most of the rest of the time as an operating room nurse. Um, I'm here speaking on behalf of the nurses at Escambia County Jail. Um, you have some really great nurses, mental health techs, nurse practitioners, and MAs that work there with lots of years of experience, and our pay does not reflect that at all. Um, your nursing staff, your mental health department are leaving very quickly. Uh, I just got an email today of two more mental health people that left, um, and last week we lost three nurses. Right now there are 12 nursing openings at the jail. First thing, I doubt that you're aware that they're, we're working with a very skeleton crew. We pretty much have no mental health department. We are tired and most likely we're not making much more than retail or fast food places if you really wanna know. My son works in retail and he makes about $2 less than I do as a nurse with 20 years of experience. We work the past year through COVID with no acknowledgement. We are face to face with COVID on a daily basis and not a single penny of compensation. Your officer should have gotten something too. Basically, what we're asking for is some sort of pay increase for the nurses that you currently have and possibly a campaign for new nurses to be retained and recruited. There needs to be incentive pay for stay and for new hires. There are nurses out there looking for jobs, but when they see what the pay is here and they get quoted, they run. There should be someone who works for retention and recruitment of nursing, mental health, and other areas in the jail. I'm not sure you understand what it's like. I work in um, work release mostly, and I'm in an open dorm with 90 inmates at a time with one officer. So we basically are in the position where if a fight breaks out, we're locked in the room with those inmates and that one officer until someone can let me out as a civilian. It gets a little hairy and sometimes the inmates are saying, it's okay, Ms. Smith, we got you. Um, but that shouldn't have to be the case. There should be pay and compensation for our lives being basically put at risk on a daily basis. Um, with mental health leaving, we have to respond to all medical emergencies, which includes suicide, seizures, um, any kind of other issue that would be medical. And we don't have enough staff right now to do that because, honestly, of the pay and the way we're treated. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Karen. Brian Cairo. Brian K. Rowe, Cantonment, Florida. Mr. Bagash, Commissioner Bagash, um, I'm a former firefighter with Scammy Fire Rescue, but I'm a fireman for life. Um, I wasn't able to address a lot of things that took place, what was going on. I want to address your union thugs issue and just let you know that don't, you, you've- uh, Wait a minute, wait, 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 I'm sorry. I've never used that term. Be very okay. careful what you say. All right, you have uh, painted us in a bad light, no, no. Union. Okay, no. I'll continue. Right. Mr. Please address um, the board. Calling members you know, by certain nicknames and things like that on your blog. No. I don't know if you understand what a fireman does day in and day out on their shifts, but when you're standing there holding a 70 year old man's hand who has no idea where he is, what he's doing, and his wife is profusely apologizing for calling us because it's the middle of the night. Um, that's humbling. While she cleans him up, puts him back together, we get him in the bed. So 
I need you to really take a look at how you treat the union members and understand that uh, I don't work for the BOCC anymore, unfortunately, or fortunately, however you want to look at it. You work for me now, so you'll be hearing a lot more from me because I'm going to be letting people know what Ms. Rogers alluded to about the fire times, the EMS times, how things work, because the data you have is wrong. We had a comp uh, uh, somebody who could do data. They're no longer here, and the data you're receiving is definitely uh, misguided. The nine minute response times are not average, and you can throw in, well, they were arrived on scene at all these different calls. I can give information to let people know how this happens and how it occurs. Fire and EMS, from right here, ECAT, the jail, everybody's understaffed. I'm wondering how y'all would operate if you were understaffed. And I need you to seriously consider the things that you're hearing tonight and make public safety a priority, make infrastructure a priority, and protect the lives of these nurses and everything else that's going on. Because you're doing a poor job. You've known about the situation at Fire and EMS for years, and it's all been mouth speak instead of actions. Breakfasts are nice, food is nice, but it doesn't do anything for us. Our fire apparatus are in jeopardy. They've been in jeopardy. Yes, we've gotten three new apparatus. One's fixing to be lemon lawed. It's terrible. So I need y'all to take a little bit of responsibility and step up and get funding where it needs to go because people are putting their lives on the line for 25 and 30 years at a time and luckily to have retirement through FRS to pay for health insurance and everything else. And this won't be the last time you hear from me. Thank you, Mr. Carroll. All right, uh, so uh, Tony McCray. Good evening. My name is Tony McRae, 1402 East Leonard Street, Pensacola, Florida. Um, I'm here to speak on the bond issues for Baptist and uh, Baptist Hospital in Lakeview. Baptist Hospital is an iconic corporation in our community. The move to the new location will definitely impact the community, but the move is definitely going to impact the neighborhood that is moving from. I would like to ask our county commissioner, Lumen May, to lead a civic engagement dialogue focusing on an inclusion strategy for businesses, contractors, the community. I understand it's a six, uh, estimated $615 million, $615 million impact of the, on the move with 57 acres still in, in the community up for, well, for determination of what's gonna happen. 400, I'm sorry, 4,261 new construction jobs are estimated. So in the spirit of Leroy Boyd and the Community Benefits Agreement that became the covenant with the community with the uh, Maritime Park, i just like to uh, propose that with the efforts of Commissioner May and other members of the commission that we have some type of civic engagement dialogue on the impact that Baptist Hospital is gonna have on the new location where, where, uh, near I-10, I-110, I but also leaving the community. What, what's that impact going to generate? Thank you very much. Thank you. Marcel? <clears throat> Marcel Davis, 4093 Cobia Street, Pensacola, Florida. Thank you for allowing us this time to speak. I just want to talk to you about the Baptist relocation and what it could mean for uh, that area. Uh, Commissioner May is a son of the Macmillan 10 who works so hard to make sure that we have single districts. And as we also like to thank uh, uh, Commissioner Underhill for helping us out in the tan yard situation where there was a lot of things that took place with relocation in which that is changing the paradigm shift. 
I'm just asking the county to maybe ask Baptists to talk to some stakeholders in the community about what is next and what are they going to do. Uh, Baptist was also a center place where people woke up and walked to have breakfast there or dinner there because the food was so good at one time. So it is important for that neighborhood to have some walk, play, and work access still in that area. Let's say, for instance, are they going to give it to a developer where he comes in and develops a whole new neighborhood, which will ch really change the political process of District 3? So we're asking for Baptists to at least have some stakeholders from the community that they're communicating with and maybe even hire an outreach coordinator so that we will know. Uh, you know, like say, for instance, they got a $600 million building budget, but we all know that we do have a covenant but what minority contractor can come in and be bonded for $20 million? We don't have in that area. So I think it would be very important for, as they move forward their relocation, uh, that we just don't have a clandestine way in which to do it, that it's open and it's honest, and so that the citizens there will know exactly what's gonna take place in their neighborhood. Plus, the county has spent money on a study. And the county spends a lot of money on study. Let's look at that study. Let's, let's not just do a study and then put it on the shelf. Let's look at what we can take from those studies in which we spent money for that will help us on this relocation. Thank you for your time. Marcel, thank you so much. Good to see you again. Uh, Ellison Bennett. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for allowing us to speak here today. I'm here on behalf of the National Movement for Human and Civil Rights. I'm a national board member. Um, my commission is, is the entire state of Florida. There's 23 people on our national board. 15 of those people either work or was on Dr. King's national staff. So I'm honored to serve. Uh, my question is, and I was hoping that somebody was here from Baptist Hospital or Commissioner May, what is going to be done with the property after the re relocation of Baptist Hospital? I think the taxpayers need to hear from somebody, the, the executive people at Baptist or somebody. What, there are so many rumors floating around about what's going to happen to that property that people just don't know. Is it going to be another abandoned building in District 3? Look how long the school district sat there. It's an eyesore on a main road in our city. So I, I hope somebody can come forward and furnish some information. And, and uh, I want to close with saying about this because uh, Reverend Davis has spoke. I took my training as a police officer in Winter Haven, Florida. I worked as a police officer in Winter Haven, Florida. It makes no sense with all the gun violence going on, and we got a massive transit location and no security, the sheriff's department is right there. Are we going to wait to something happen to have security at ECAT to protect those people? That When I heard that, I said, that's, that just doesn't make sense. It's an easy fix. If we work together as elected officials and citizens, we can get great things done. And Commissioner Underhill, you know I'm speaking the truth about that. Commissioner Bagash, you know I'm speaking the truth. If we can work together, we have issues, but we can find solutions if we all work to, for the better good of every citizen of this county. So I don't want to see something happen at uh, ECAT because the decision is not made to have security there. Uh, so I think that's a, a serious priority that should be addressed. And I hope Baptist Hospital officials have some type of town hall meeting to speak to the public. What is going to be done with that building? Are we going to have executive offices there? Or, uh, and I heard that the relationship between Baptist and Lakeview have been resolved. The community don't know about that. So please. Inform the community. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your service also. Uh, Jeremy Balso. Good evening. Jeremy Basso, 11 Bowman Place. 
Uh, I just want to say I'm very disturbed about recent news reports about a, uh, the allegation that a county employee tried to find out the identity and the location of a citizen for nothing more than submitting an anonymous public records request. This is disturbing. This is extremely disturbing. People say, well, well, why would you place an anonymous records request? Well, you know, a lot of people simply fear possible retaliation by their government. And instances like this just solidify that very real fear that some citizens have. This cannot stand. It cannot stand. This should concern every citizen of this county. And the irony is that the county employee that allegedly tried to unmask a private citizen demands their own anonymity. Outrageous. Outrageous. People have a First Amendment right to petition their government for redress of grievances. And public records requests, in my mind, fall under the First Amendment. I hope, my hope, is that you all take this incident very seriously. I would like to encourage you, every one of you, to seek public accountability on this. The public needs to know that something is being done to dealt with this. Citizens cannot be targeted. Government cannot be weaponized against private citizens for a public records request. I don't expect this to die down. I expect action from the board, and, and I would appreciate that. I apologize to get a little upset, but uh, I think we should all be a little upset about this, and I do want to thank you for your time. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you. Uh, board, that's the last speaker. Um, we'll adjourn uh, until 540.
Good evening, everyone. It is coming up on 545. Called to order the Board of County Commissioners meeting for June 3rd. Please turn your cell phone to the vibrate, silence, or offsetting. The Board of County Commissioners allows any person to speak regarding an item on the agenda. The speaker is limited to three minutes, unless otherwise determined by the chairman to allow sufficient time for all speakers. Speakers shall refrain from abusive or profane remarks, disruptive outbursts, protests, or other conduct which interferes with the orderly conduct of the meeting. Upon completion of the public comment period, discussion is limited to board members and questions raised by the board. Um, so let's see. Tonight, uh, I have the invocation. Uh, we have Josh Burdick. The CARES Pastor at Pensacola Christian College. Josh, come on. And then Commissioner Barry will lead us in the pledge. All right, let's pray. Almighty God, we come before you tonight and acknowledge you as a sovereign creator. And we ask tonight, as we begin this meeting, that you would guide us and direct. Father, we pray for wisdom in the matters discussed this evening. I pray that you would be with our leaders and ask that you would help them as they hear uh, each person tonight. I pray, Father, that you would just give them the wisdom and discernment that they need to make the difficult decisions. And Father, we pray that as citizens that we would do our part and reflect you in everything that we do. I pray that we would love one another. I pray, Father, that we would uh, do the right thing and that we would work hard to live that quiet and peaceful life before you. Be with us now in this meeting. Direct us and guide us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please join me in the pledge to our flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Josh, thank you so much. Are there any items to be added to the agenda? Commissioner, I'm dropping the county attorney's item 1-2 about Lakeview. Okay. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to add a discussion item, uh, perhaps towards the end of the administrator's report about the process that, uh, the process in which we handle public records requests and, um, you know, candidly, I'm going to be, uh, I'm gonna be asking that uh, the board clarify what I, what I thought was previous board uh, previous board direction or board policy that um, um, that those requests on some at some point in time work their way through our county attorney's office one of our two paid for uh, one of our two paid direct employees um, yeah and hopefully the board will uh, entertain such that discussion thank you yes sir uh, commissioner uh, commissioner underhill nothing dad okay commissioner Barry on the Burgosh no add-ons uh, I don't have any, uh, Madam Administrator. Uh, okay, no add-ons there. Take a motion. Move that we accept the agenda as amended. Second. Okay, please vote. Motion passes 4-0 with Commissioner May off the dais, and uh, I think he will be off the dais for some, some time, so um, not to have to repeat myself on that. Commissioner's forum, Commissioner Berry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just very briefly, I want to thank our, uh, thank our legislation for our legislative delegation for their work this session and, uh, uh, and their successful work in having some, uh, you know, having some line item allocations for Escambia County included in the, gov uh, in the budget that went to the governor, and then some effective lobbying uh, on our behalf that, uh, that kept those items in there. Um, the $2.5 million of additional funding toward the Bluffs project is gonna make a tremendous, uh, is gonna make a tremendous difference and, um, and start to really put, that's gonna be uh, the dollars that begin to put some, uh, some project footprint on the ground of what's happening in that area. I know uh, that's something Commissioner Bergash and I can, you know, can work with and, and, uh, uh, and kind of celebrate on the PEDC board, um, as well as an allocation for the town of Century that, um, you know, I want to thank Commissioner Broxson specifically for both, but, um, you know, in addition to Representative Andrade and Representative Salzman from Escambia County, uh, 
I'll specifically uh, also mention my good friend from Santa Rosa County, Jerry Williamson, who advocated uh, to a tremendous degree on uh, on our on our behalf as well. I know uh, you know part of part of being part of being in leadership and that type of position is, is seeing it as larger than just uh, the area you represent. And I know that he does that, and I appreciate that. So uh, I want to specifically thank them tonight for the good news that uh, just didn't include bad news from the governor's office. So. Thank you, Commissioner Underhill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, one of the great things about being a, a kid growing up in Escambia County is access to the National Flight Academy and the summertime uh, flight academy camps that take place. Uh, unfortunately, uh, because of the current uh, security conditions on our bases, um, the camp is not available to any uh, children who are unable to attend without a uh, uh, military member that can sponsor them onto base and off base um, uh, for the event. I um, just want to put out there that if there are any uh, citizens in your districts who are interested in their children going, um, we can probably work together to find a retired or active duty military member who would be uh, interested in sponsoring that uh, child and get them uh, to the event. Um, you know, it's, a, uh, it's an un unfortunately in our world, uh, it's necessary that Region Southeast put those kind of constraints in place. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we can't uh, do everything that we can within the law um, to uh, enable our children uh, in Escambia County to still be able to take advantage of that great asset. So um, the, it, probably the best way to handle that is if anybody wants to just get a hold of my office, uh, I'd be more than happy to, to put them in contact, or I'm sure all of you have uh, also friends who, uh, who have those base privileges. Mm -hmm. Um, not sure what the uh, what all steps would need to be taken place, but uh, I'm sure that uh, you know, people of goodwill can come together and figure out a way to make that happen. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Bergosh. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Bender. A couple of things. I want to thank the Boy Scouts and the Cub Scouts who came out to Barrancas National Cemetery and, and planted the flags for Memorial Day. Um, I know they do that every year, and it's just it, it was just great uh, that they were able to do that, um, <clears throat> and it means a lot. And I want to thank every uh, veteran in our community who served, um, including my daughter and my son and my brother, and most especially all of those who didn't make it back and gave their lives. I mean, we all enjoyed a, an excellent weekend, great weather, friendship, barbecues, but the real reason for all of that was for the sacrifices made by those that came before us. So to everyone who served, um, you have my gratitude and my thanks. I also want to, uh, we had some good news that kind of came. There's a lot going on. A lot of times the good news doesn't really uh, percolate to the surface, but we did receive nearly 31 million. It's in the bank, uh, which represents half of our county's allocation from the American Rescue Plan. And so there's a lot of different directions that money is gonna go. It's gonna do a lot of great things in the community. Um, it was unexpected, so, <laughs> but that doesn't mean we won't have uses for it, but that's great news. That's in the bank, according to Amber McClure. So thanks for uh, sending that good news out yesterday, Amber. It didn't, it, it didn't go unnoticed. And then finally, I would like to invite the public uh, Wednesday, June 23rd, um, from 5.30 to 7.30. Um, we are going to have a public comment meeting, and we're going to give a project overview to the Longleaf Corridor project. We're going to uh, redesign that street. It, it goes from uh, Pine Forest Road over to Weimart. We're going to add uh, sidewalks. We're going to add bike paths, lighting, drainage. It's going to be a tremendous project. It's about a $6.5 million project. And um, I'm going to be there, staff's going to be there, and we are going to uh, present what that will look like. So to anyone in that community, the Bellevue community of District 1, or any uh, concerned citizens, join us that evening and see where your tax dollars are going. We're, we've got that project on a fast track. That's a t in fact, I've talked to Christine Fancy. She assures me we can do it within two years. So uh, we're going to see if that can happen. Um, Wednesday the 23rd. Uh, 537 Long, uh, Longleaf Elementary School. And thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, of course, the, uh, the big talk this weekend was also the reopening of the bridge. Um, so I want to um, I, I want to thank FDOT for um, continuing to hear our, our pleas in getting that done by Memorial Day. And, uh, um, and they were able to do that. Of course, we would have liked to be um, sooner. But uh, I, I think it, it led to a, a great weekend uh, in Gulf Breeze, Pensacola Beach, and then those that, that wanted to come into Pensacola that hadn't had the opportunity to do so in a while. So um, hopefully, um, you know, I'd say from a, a safety standpoint, um, there are independent ins inspectors um, that, that the county works with 
uh, on projects across the county that, that are part of the inspection process um, that, that feel that it is safe um, and given their seal. So, Joy, I just recognize that. I mean, that's, those are people that we work with that are independent of Skanska, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, I've, uh, I've driven across it. I've driven my family across it. And, uh, and so we, I, I think if, um, if FDOT or Skanska had attempted or, or had um, gone ahead with the earlier opening and not made the repairs that were made up here 69 and 70, um, you know, I think by, by being so close and then having to make those repairs shows that uh, their commitment to um, having it be built correctly. Um, so I, I know we all are happy that it's open. Um, just please be mindful of the new traffic pattern getting on there on the Pensacola side. Um, not, not trying to U-turn off of Bayfront in, on, onto back onto Bayfront at Chase and things like that, but um, we, we are still pushing to get the four lane open as quickly as, as possible um, and uh, continue to work with FDOT on that. Um, uh, I, I did have the, the honor of attending the, the Memorial Day ceremony um, at the Veterans Memorial Park and uh, thank you for all those that, that came out to support um, those that we have lost uh, protecting our country and um, it, it was a it was a well attended um, and um, appreciate everyone who played a part in that also on um, Tuesday evening I, I was happened to be at uh, squad three when a, uh, a call came out and uh, was uh, was there as uh, engine six squad three engine one engine 17 tower seven engine seven ladder 12 and battalion chiefs two and three uh, put out a single story structure fire. Uh, also EMS quickly responded to the, the uh, individual that was in the house uh, at the time of the fire and, um, and they were able to quickly bring that under control. So um, it was, uh, uh, glad I was able to see them. And then um, actually part of the reason I was there was because uh, squad three had um, entertained um, my kids for a little bit when, uh, when we stopped by and see them after the heroes um, church service. And so I was a little bit of a thank you. And, and uh, so I ended up getting an answer some of the questions that my son had asked them that day of, uh, you know, what do you do when you are trying to eat and you get a call? Um, it happened to us twice. So, um, um, but, uh, but anyway, I appreciate all that they do and, and, uh, and everything else. Um, Debbie, you have anything? Okay. Uh, proclamations, I'll take a motion. Chairman, I move we uh, accept proclamations A and B. Second. Please vote. Motion passes 4-0. Good evening, Commissioner. Good evening, Andrew. Um, <clears throat> so this is our Employee of the Month presentation. This is Rachel Whitmire, our Employee of the Month. Um, in lieu of reading through the whole proclamation, Rachel asked if I'd just tell you a few nice words about her. <laughs> um, dangerous. That is very dangerous. <laughs> so it, it's a very unique situation here. Uh, Rachel started last July. And as you know, last July, the months that followed were kind of chaotic between the pandemic, the hurricane, and the aftermath of that, and new software coming online. Um, very tough time to start a new job, but uh, Rachel's been an absolute trooper. Um, the first thing it seemed like she said, and it seems like she, I hear it all the time, is, what can I do to help? And that's just, that spirit is amazing and it's very helpful. She's, uh, she's very outgoing, eager, and has a servant's heart. She's essentially the piece of our department puzzle that's been missing for a long time. And we're, we're very glad that she's here with us. Her, uh, her primary duties are serving as the clerk to the Board of Adjustment and the Planning Board, which means she handles all the scheduling. She sends out all the advertisements, 
All the mailers go out, she assembles the meeting packets, and toughest of all, she keeps the staff on track. Uh, <laughs> I describe it as <laughs> kind of like herding cats. Um, but she does a great job at it. So, she is our September, our, man, why did I say September? <laughs> I'm already thinking hurricane season, right? Um, so, well, you know, one thing else. When we interview people um, to come work in our department, I always look for indications that they understand it, it takes a special spirit to be a public servant. And I, I like to see that they realize we really are one big team and that everybody needs to be willing to jump in and help out wherever they're needed. Rachel embodies that. Um, and we're very happy she's with us and proud that she is the June, I got it right, June 2021 Employee of the Month. Congratulations. <laughs> So I want to start out by just thanking my leadership more than anything, um, Kayla and Carla, Drew and Horace, even uh, Kia Johnson in, in the County Administrator's Department and um, County Attorney's Department, and Juan Lemos in the SRI. Um, these individuals really make it to where I love my job, I love coming to work, I say it all the time. Um, more importantly, representing the Development Services Department, I did not realize how much the department does between planning and zoning, DRC, the GIS. Uh, we even have site inspectors in our department. And as an average citizen, you don't realize how much they do until you're doing it. So I'm more proud just to represent that department. And I'm just very grateful to earn the recognition um, so just thank you. <laughs> oh my gosh, Horace. You want to hold on and say? Oh yeah, yeah. Dr. Bryan, Jay. Good evening. I want to take a moment of personal privilege here to say first and foremost, I thank this board. When I was uh, in my second year <clears throat> in 2018, uh, wanting to fulfill a campaign promise, I brought to this board the concept of a Northwest District 1 advisory committee to help us uh, manage the growth that had really gone um, unbridled. And I know that because I live out there. And so this board, with their support, we had a, a vote and we were able to impanel a nine member committee. Uh, standing before you this evening are three of the members of that committee. Unfortunately, the others, for a lot of various reasons, could not be here tonight. But I wanna make special recognition to the folks that are here tonight. This is Dr. Laura Bryant, welcome and thank you. She served as the chairman of the committee through our uh, 14 meetings, 14 public meetings that we held. Mr. Jay Ingwell is here as well. He also uh, serves as my uh, appointee on the planning board and he puts in a lot of hours for this county for no compensation. He also served diligently on this committee. And also Mr. George Levy, we appreciate him. He showed up at every single meeting, asked a lot of great questions and since that time has really um, taken a, a big interest in the county. He's uh, communicating with my office very frequently on a lot of different topics. So we were glad to have his engagement. So to each, each of you, thank you for your service. Um, over the course of the 14 months, we were able to uh, put together a very, very solid uh, list of milestones and benchmarks. We were, we were actually able to engage UWF, the Haas Center. We did a very uh, extensive polling of the entire area and we had thousands and thousands of, uh, of responses from citizens. And that is going to allow us uh, to take that data and put together a plan for that part of the county. And hopefully it'll be something very, very, something that we can all be very, very proud of. And along the way, these folks helped us along with Chips and his team uh, to secure $300,000, which we will use to do a master plan for that, for that area. So uh, as a resident of Beulah and District 1 and, and the representative, I'm very proud of what's happening out there. It, we're starting to turn things in the right direction. We just opened a Publix. The four laning of Nine Mile Road is going to happen. Um, 
It's a couple years behind, but it's going to happen. I'm told eventually it will happen. Uh, I want to believe, right? So without further ado, I do appreciate uh, your indulgence, uh, Mr. Chairman, of a little extra time, but um, these folks made their way here. And by the way, I do have, uh, we do have these uh, nice framed uh, plaques and proclamations for each of the nine members of the committee, and, and our office will coordinate with the members to get it to them. So without further ado, I'll go ahead and read this proclamation. Whereas, at the regularly scheduled meeting of the Board of County Commissioners on June 7, 2018, the Board authorized the District 1 Commissioner to nominate a nine-member advisory committee to assist the Board in solving important issues facing the communities of the Northwest portions of District 1 in Escambia County. And whereas, the committee was named the Northwest District 1 Advisory Committee and consisted of the following members, Dr. Laura Bryant, who was the chairman, Kim Adderholt, Paul Flores, Jay Ingwell, Jill Johnson, George Levy, David Lichty, Joseph Poitavin, and Wilson Taylor, and whereas the committee was tasked to explore, research, provide technical or practical expertise, and make recommendations to the District 1 Commissioner regarding those issues of relevance and significant importance to the citizens of the northwest portion of District 1 of Escambia County, and whereas the committee's desire to help improve their community and the citizens' involvement on these issues is vital to the county's consideration of them. Your input will result in our best opportunity to maximize the greater Beulah community and the entire Northwest section of District 1, where so many of our citizens live, work, shop, eat, and play. Whereas, because of the diligence and hard work of the Northwest District 1 Advisory Committee, the citizens of District 1 are proud to say the committee met its goal of providing well-thought-out needs and benchmarks for the future development of the Beulah community and Northwest District 1. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed that the Board of County Commissioners of Escambia County, Florida, and the citizens of District 1 commend and congratulate the Northwest District 1 Advisory Committee members on a job well done. Thank you very much. Okay. Ready. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Bryant, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you. Uh, the commissioner stole most of my thunder by thanking just about everybody I was going to thank. Um, so I'm going to have to rethink what I was going to say real quick. Um, I'd first like to thank the board, county commissioners. I really appreciate your support. We all appreciate your support um, in agreeing to um, put together the committee so that we could work to serve the citizens of uh, Beulah, District 1, and really all of Escambia County. Um, I would also like to thank my committee members who were kind enough to give their free time uh, several evenings. Some of those meetings ran really long um, and who deemed fit to let me stay as the chairwoman twice. Um, I'd also like to thank UWF for doing the survey for us, uh, the citizens of Escambia County for completing the survey. We appreciate that. Um, I cannot forget staff. Yes. Staff. Uh, Drew, Horace, Debbie was phenomenal, uh, hurting all of us, keeping all of us on schedule, taking the notes. Um, and providing us with information. So I really appreciate staff, again, giving up their free time, driving out to our portion of the town, which is nowhere near here. Um, and for some of them, that drive was substantial. So uh, we appreciate them uh, doing that. And also um, being able to use the school, uh, the new school over yes. in Beulah, uh, the principal very kindly opened up the school for us every evening so that we could meet in the area, which made it much uh, easier for residents to access that area. So that was very, uh, we really appreciate that. And I would just like to say, um, I appreciate getting to serve and help the county and I hope to do more in the future. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, I was remiss. Drew, Horace, Charlie <coughs> Gonzalez, uh, Juan Lemos, I mean, all your staff that, that gave all their time and Debbie, of course, I was remiss in, in not thanking you. Thank you. That was a lot of time, a lot of commitment, and you guys really did a great job. Thank you for that. All right. Uh, written communication. Mr. Chairman, as I mentioned this morning, um, I would ask that the board uh, grant uh, right. grant the requested relief. Oh, two speakers? Apologize. Sorry. Go ahead. I forgot about that. Sorry. I don't scroll down a little bit, but. Um, 
It's uh, Vera Pilgrim and William Spiegel. And I and Vera, I think you are the petition or the. So it, it, I think Commissioner Barry is is going to. Are you going to? You're in favor of it. So he is in favor of granting the 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 release. Oh, thank you. Do you, do you still want to speak, or do you want to let him go ahead and? No, sir. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, I make a motion to grant the requested relief. Second. Okay. Please vote. Motion passes 4 0. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Do the clerk's office receive the proofs of publication? Mr. Chairman, the clerk's office has received all proofs. Move, the wa move that we waive the reading. Second. Please vote. Motion passes 4 0. Clerk and Comptroller's report. Yes, sir. I have two items on the consent agenda. The first one has to do with the investment report. The second one is minutes and reports that we file. But just to restate this morning's news that was about the tourist development collections being at 1.5 million, which is about a 25% apples to apples um, increase over 2019. But it's good for our viewers to hear that. That's fantastic. That's great. Move Especially the clerk's report items one and two. Second. Please vote. Motion passes 4-0. Horace. Yes, sir. I believe we can probably take items 1, 2, and 3 with the joint um, motion for a cancellation of items 1, 2, and 3. Sounds good. So moved. Second. Please vote. Motion passes 4-0. Then we have the uh, GMR action item. Any speakers, Mr. Chairman? No, sir, we don't. I move we approve item one. Under Second. Agreement. Please vote. Motion passes 4-0. Then we have our consent agenda for July the 8th. Move Sk the consent agenda. Yeah. Second. All right, please vote. Motion passes 4-0. County Administrator's report. We have uh, 11 items on the consent agenda. We do not have any speakers in car one. We are, um, have we updated the uh, recommendation on 10 to include that was already updated? <clears throat> so that's been updated. Do we have any? We don't have any speakers. No, are we sir. holding any of these items? We're not holding one through 11. No, then I move car one in its entirety. Second. Any discussion? Please vote. Motion passes four to zero. All right, we have speakers on eight and we're holding 15. Those are the only two? Yes, sir. Move the balance. Second. And the change has been made on the item related to Level Mile Creek about the funding. That's, that's number eight, right? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. We're holding it. All right. Please vote. Motion passes 4 0. 
Okay, item eight, we have two speakers. Uh, Bill Hoff. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Bill Hoff. <clears throat> we have property in Bristol Park, and um, one of the things I've got my daughter in there living right now, but uh, <clears throat> we're concerned about is the flooding. We've been gone through two of the big floods that we had recently in 14 and in uh, this last year. <clears throat> so anyway, we formed an ad hoc committee to talk about some of this stuff, and, um, and I was kind of the leader on that, so I had a few people that uh, were with me, and Barbara Albrecht was one of them. She's an expert uh, environmentalist, and she couldn't be here tonight because she's teaching a class, so she asked me to read a statement that she made on, on, uh, this, uh, on an email. It says, I won't be able to attend. Would I like to receive clarification on what Content, uh, what I contend to be a large uh, contradiction. How can the state mandate comprehensive plans from counties and counties collect and integrate community input plus funding, plus road growth, et cetera, into land development codes, <clears throat> which can require more than the state regulations, not less, and still collect dollars via permits and taxes? and continue allowing development in risky areas, basically bro brokering the landscape. That's her statement. Thank you. Thank you. Chris Kerb. I think you have a handout for you guys. I left my flash drive at home, so I didn't get to put it up here. Um, you guys know who I am. I'm a subject matter advisor, technical advisor for flood defenders. Um, we are now have 958 residents that have joined our uh, Facebook page. Um, I'm, I'm here to speak on this agenda item for uh, awarding a contract for Mott McDonald for stream restoration project on 11 Mile Creek. Um, the Bristol Park neighborhood welcomes this project. Uh, it's gonna help protect them from flooding. So I'm told they, they um, welcome the project. Um, I think it's great that the county is gonna invest in this neighborhood with the restore funds. Um, I understand that Commissioner Barry chose this project as well as another uh, project from, from all the restore projects. So that, that, that's a good thing. Uh, it's also great that uh, this project is gonna include repairs of existing infrastructure. Um, the uh, county's done a lot of progress in, in Bristol Park, Ashbury Hills, and Bristol Creek along the 11 Mile Creek Basin following the April 2014 storm, but there's a lot more that needs to be done. Um, this scope of work contract agreement does include the design rehabilitation of three non-functioning stormwater ponds. But I got a few comments on that, on this contract. Mott McDonald has a separate ongoing contract um, for HMGP applications. And uh, that, that'll be property acquisition for buyouts. Um, your contract only allows for 18 months in the timeline and land acquisition is gonna be a big issue that you're gonna to have to deal with for this project because the property needs to, for a good floodplain restoration project, um, you, you, gotta, you gotta have more property to have a better floodplain management. If you don't have the property, you, your project's gonna fail. So um, I think you need more time in this contract for land acquisition and property acquisition. There was actually a report done in 11 Mile Creek, uh, geomorphic assessment report. That's your first handout there that I gave you with a map. That's in county records. Uh, I suggest y'all posting it on your website. 
Um, the report has stream options and it compares those options. But again, 18 months is not enough time for land acquisition or easement acquisition. Um, I've only got 13 seconds, but you can read the rest of it. Um, if you got any questions, give me a call. Uh, I'll be glad to talk with you about it. I'd like to have lunch with you one day, Commissioner Barry, and talk about it a little more. Thank you, Chris. Commissioner Barry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I was referencing had the item been adjusted with the references to the funding. Commissioner Barry, I noted during the agenda work session and we'll note in the minutes for tonight that any tasks that exceed the 1,150,000 will be brought back to the board to identify a funding source and that the only purchase order anticipated to be issued currently will be for the 1,150,000. But we will be leaving the language in the agreement referencing those referencing those tasks because they will become a part of the construction management and those things. Okay. All right. Super. Um, Mr. Chairman, if there aren't any questions, I, I move the item. Second. Okay. Please. Any discussion? Please vote. Thanks, sir. Motion passes 5-0 with Commissioner May on the dais. Good to see you, sir. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, car 3-1. Oh, oh, sorry. That's all right. Yep, 215. Commissioner May, did you want this held? Who held? Mr. Chairman, I, I, I'm who asked for that to, okay. uh, sorry about to, that to be held. Did, okay, obviously we've had issues with software and software related issues uh, a lot of money on software. over the, over the years not unfortunately not just one not just one instance of it um, and I saw in the backup you know we had uh, you know we had a few people on the evaluative uh, on the evaluative committee you know we had two responses to the uh, you know to the request and uh, so we had two vendors that submitted and uh, I don't know all the people that, I, I don't know the names of the folks that were on the committee. I, don't, I just don't recognize the names, so I'm not sure exactly what their capacities are. Um, did we have some, some of our IT or software people involved in that? That might yes. have been one of the names I didn't recognize. Yes, sir. Uh, Chris uh, Kilstrom from IT was on the um, selection committee as well as myself and Howard Fanslow with the West Florida Regional Planning Council, well, Emerald Coast Regional Planning Council. Okay, and, and I believe Mr. Kim, Mr. Kimbrough was on there as well. Okay, but the other name you said that gentleman is from IT. Um, yes, sir, Chris Kilstrom. Okay, all right. I just didn't recognize the name, um, Mr. Chairman. That's that's good enough. Uh, I, you know, it seems as if we have buy-in from IT that this is going to be a good fit. I hope that's the case. It is very expensive. Um, uh, you know, I recognize that we are using grant funds for it. You know, the grant funds candidly could also be used for bus purchases or other things. So just because the grant funds doesn't necessarily mean that, um, that you know, that's a fix all for it. But if. Um, and that would be my question, Steve. I mean, and, and telling if these grant funds, I mean, and, and I, I got the letter from ECAT that probably everyone else has gotten. You know, although I love technology, I mean, could this money be used for bus purchases or is this the most critical and essential need? And the best use of funds, uh, because the complaint I'm getting from drivers and many of them have walked out is uh, the condition of our buses. And uh, I think I talked to Wesley today. We hadn't purchased a new bus since 2012. Is that correct? Um, 2015, but we did have a purchase on the last board meeting for two Gillick buses. So we did purchase two buses on our last board meeting. Um, this software is very critical. Um, we are one of the few systems that I'm aware of that does not have scheduling software. So we still do our route schedules by hand. So this is... And this brings about efficiency. Yes, sir, absolutely. Does it reduce any number of personnel? I mean, will you be able to do the job with two people us, instead of six by it this? It gives us the opportunity. I'm sorry, Commissioner. No, it you gives us ahead. the yeah. opportunity you know to what? actually have a dashboard and analytics. I know in the past that the board has asked as far as route efficiencies, uh, which routes that we're able, if we need to modify or improve them, and this will give us the ability to have that analytics to actually provide you that information. Does it bring about any cost savings? 
ultimately, yes, sir, because we'll be able to be more efficient on our scheduling. We'll be more flexible and adaptive as far as when we do our route scheduling. Um, yes, we do need buses, but yes, we also need to have the software and the capability to be efficient and have that software to use it. And I'm good, Tanya. But here's the deal. We spent millions of dollars on technology, and we still can't get an efficient public records request out. So if it's bringing about efficiency, I'm all for it. But uh, please just keep in mind uh, uh, that the citizens, uh, although they appreciate um, technology, they, they certainly uh, appreciate the opportunity to ride on a decent bus. And so if we can, if there's grant funds that in which we can purchase uh, buses that the average citizen uh, that I represent rides, let's keep that in mind as we move forward. I didn't know that we hadn't bought any buses. You said 2015. Yes, sir. I thought it was 2012, but I mean, still 2015, that's been a long time. I yes, mean, sir. E every month I, I approve dump trucks and tractors and all type of uh, uh, equipment. Uh, I'd love to see uh, that we're purchasing some buses for our citizens to ride on. Yes, sir. We have some more coming up in the next couple of uh, months. You'll see another purchase as well. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Tanya, yes, sir. How, how about the, the partnership and the acquisition with the, the entity out of South Florida that was supposed to, that's supposed to be sending 10 buses up or eight buses, some large, relatively large number? Yes, sir. Um, we've been in uh, contact with um, Sarasota County, okay. and they're uh, in the process of transferring, hopefully, uh, 10 2017 Gillick buses. Um, and it would be a transfer from uh, agency to agency through F Federal Transit Administration, FTA. So that means it would be very minimal impact for us financially. Um, but that's uh, well-needed buses that we need for our service. So we are very aware that our, our, we have a very aging fleet. And we also are programming some additional of our old grants for uh, bus purchases as well. When, when do we think that that might come to fruition? Um, we have already been in contact with uh, Sarasota County. Um, we're uh, trying to schedule a meeting to go down there to actually physically see the uh, vehicles as well. So hopefully as soon as they get clearance from uh, Federal Transit Administration, hopefully we'll be able to make a quick transfer of those vehicles. I mean, they're 2017. I mean, they could take pictures and send them. I mean, they can't be that bad if the newest one, if the newest ones we have is one from 2015 plus, you know, one or two more that we might have purchased. I mean, is there anything our board can do to facilitate that transfer in a more expedient manner? Uh, no, sir. There's actually nothing that we could actually do on our end okay. uh, with, uh, uh, with with FTA. Uh, but I will make sure that I get the actual pictures sent to the, the board now. Uh, oh, those, vehicles, those vehicles look uh, extremely. They're they're really good. Okay, great. Well, if there's any if there's anything the board can do, or if there's any request or letter to FTA to, you know, to to try to support the transfer or transfer or certainly, you know. Uh, letters of appreciation to Sarasota County Transit or whoever runs their transit agency. I mean, that's a, that would be seen as, to me, that, that seems like a big deal. And anything that we can do to recognize their partnership in that and, uh, and or to facilitate, you know, the, the FTA request, you know, moving forward. Thanks. All right. Rodriguez, what's the oldest bus we have in our fleet that's on the uh, road every day? So uh, the oldest bus that's actually on, on our fleet is the actual 1998. Now, uh, that 1998 is currently uh, has, it is not being utilized. Uh, so the actual current the oldest current bus, bus is being utilized daily. What's what? 1999, sir. 1999. And what is the average lifespan uh, of a bus in a mass transit fleet? Uh, the average lifespan is, is seven years. So we are well beyond the seven years. Yes, sir. So, which I, the cost of not buying a uh, pr puts us in a very <laughs> tough situation liability wise I mean and, 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 and uh, breaking down so if there are grant funds and, and I know Wesley's here if there are grant funds we need to get buses I mean it's it's seven years and, and, and I knew the response to that Rodriguez to not put you on the spot but if we have buses that have been there since 1999 and we've not bought buses uh, we need to figure out rather it's grants and if we have grants that we've not expended we need to aggressively make sure that we have uh, quality buses for our drivers to drive. And, you know, yes, sir, that's understood. And the capital replacement, that, I, I know that's been a focus of Ms. Ellis uh, uh, currently, her and our new finance man manager. Uh, the capital replacement, we, we will begin to make that capital replacement. And I know going forward, we'll begin to make the purchase of buses to get us on the schedule that we should be. But I will say to the board members, this, this, this software this, this software allow our preventive maintenance, scheduling services. It, it's, 
this is what we need in order for us to be a premier transit agency and and and, and going forward. So this this will be great for us. Uh, thank you, Ray. I mean, and just for the record, I mean, we have a bus that's a 1999 bus. We're in 2021. The average life expectancy of a bus is seven years. Yes, sir. To me, that's not a service. In my opinion, I mean, it's outlived its life. I mean, and so the last thing we need to do is for someone to break down. I mean, that's, in, in my opinion, in stewardship, it's unacceptable. Oh, yeah, so yes, sir. we need to figure out what we need to do. And as Commissioner Berry has said, uh, it should be brought forth and allow for the five people of this to ask to vote it up or vote it down. Uh, but your position is to provide for the safety of citizens. And if you have uh, buses that have been in service since 1999, I, I would assure you that other unions and other departments would be down here screaming if they had a tractor or a bus or a truck uh, that was in service in 1999 and it's 2021 and we've not renewed it. And we do have in our hands the lives of citizens who are vulnerable citizens. So. Uh, I look forward to y'all bringing that forward. And yes, so, sir. Well, I think Wesley's here, and so I hope that you know that doesn't fall on deaf ears, Wesley. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A uh, quick question: um, With the other capital purchases for vehicles, um, I've been provided a, a graph that really kind of shows your annual maintenance costs, um, and and you know which typically are very low for a new vehicle and increase exponentially over time. Um, if I could see a similar uh, uh, graph, a similar uh, amount of rigor on the part of the ECAT buses, um, you know, ideally we'd all have, they'd all be brand new. Um, but if you look at your costs of maintenance over time, it becomes very clear where your uh, replacement mm -hmm. point should be. Um, and that's the kind of thing that it would, just like with the tractors and all the other vehicles that Commissioner May just mentioned, um, you know, that should be a set purchase. We know exactly, we, we have a, a reasonable knowledge of when the cost of maintaining an old vehicle is is greater than the cost of purchase a new one um, and we should be able to build that into our our budget you know in the out years it should not be something that we argue about every year um, because that's basically the cost of doing business um, and it's it's very it's fairly fixed and it's uh, it's fairly uh, uh, measurable uh, so if you guys could work on getting that mm -hmm. to me uh, i'd certainly like to see it it has been very effective for the other departments that have done that um, in you know, in determining where my uh, my support is for the for those new purchases. Thank yes, you. Yes, sir. And, and I agree with Commissioner uh, um, Underhill on that. I, I'd like to get that report. And one final question. Yeah. Uh, and this new software, it kind of ties into our our universal GPS and tracking of buses, knowing where buses are. Does that enhance that to know you know routes, how long they stop, where they move? Does that help out with that? Yes, sir. And actually, it has a, a maintenance component. That will be very helpful as far as looking at our preventive maintenance as well as when there's alerts on the buses it ties into that gps as far as we can notify our technicians as well um, for as far as the history of the uh, any maintenance that's required thank you mr chairman thank you take a motion so move second all right please vote Motion passes 5-0. Uh, CAR 3-1, recommendation concerning the gubernatorial appointment of the District 1 medical examiner. So moved, Mr. Chairman. There's Thank a form, I'm sorry, this is not my okay. item, but I do see there's a form that they're asking that you all complete. And um, I would suggest <coughs> maybe you wanna delegate to the administrator's office that they could complete and sign it on your behalf. That might be one way to do it. Would well, the chairman, could the chairman sign it? Or, or the chairman, I mean. I would move the item with the chairman sign it after his review. Um, second. So we have the template, whatever it is they want. So it's just a, it's just a, it's how just do you page. rate the quality oh, okay. of the medical examiner, favorable, unfavorable, or no opinion, and then uh, completed by signature. I, I would, um, uh, I would probably ask that it be done by our DOMS representative. By what? Or 
So if you don't want to sign it, I was just doing it. I'll, I'll, I was doing fine. it with respect to you. I don't care do, whoever you want do, to sign do, it. Do we all feel that's favorable then? Mr. Chairman, the motion and my second, I think if we restate it where the, the form is filled out by the Dome's representative and signed by the chairman. That I'm, I'm, I'm good. It doesn't matter to me. I mean, second I was, stance. I was okay. respecting the chairman. Please vote. Motion passes 5-0. Uh, we are uh, uh, not taking item two today, and then we come up to Commissioner Barry's add-on. Okay. All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, I'm sorry, the add-on or number three? Uh, well, number three is the, Okay. The, yeah, we're just adding it to the discussion All right. item. All right, thank you, and, uh, and I appreciate the <coughs> attorney. Uh, Madam Attorney, putting on this uh, putting this on the agenda, um, I have asked her if uh, if we would schedule for the seventeenth uh, discussion. Oh, no, this is for your uh, add-on. Yeah, your add-on. Yeah. Okay. Which is, 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 is yeah, okay. public records which were made for number three. Where are we? Okay. We have to the county attorney. And then we come back to number three. We're still in. Oh, right? I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. we're still in. I got gotcha. you. Discussion. Um, so. What I'd like to do is, is, is clarify and, and, again, do what I uh, clarify or refine what I, what I thought the process was and what I think, that, um, what I think has been the practice, um, you know, of the board or at least the, the uh, you know, maybe if we need to define the policy or, or refine the policy. But for public records requests that, um, that go out, I would like those to be vetted through the county attorney's office. Uh, for redacting, for the redacting of public information or, or um, for the redacting of private information. And um, just as having one central place that these requests come out or go out to the public from, um, you know, clearly we have, we, have two, we have two employees that we have, uh, you know, direct, uh, you know, direct um, uh, responsibilities for their employment being the administrator and the attorney. And uh, what I'd like to do is, I, I thought, especially when it, retain, when it pertains to, you know, if it's emails, copies of emails and, and communications and thing like, things like that, I would think everything goes through Allison's office, but I think we need to uh, clearly have some of that conversation and give that direction that we would like to make sure that, or I would like to make sure that that is what's happening. Um, I don't think that it's a, I don't think that departments should themselves be fulfilling public records requests and then supplying those to the requester. They, I think there needs to be one, one place that they go through and, uh, uh, and I think it stands to reason that be the county attorney's office. Commissioner Berry, uh, and, and, and I'm supportive of that, um, but what I do believe uh, is that as a public record request comes through, you know, any one of the five offices or a department that, uh, it should be filled by the office in which it was requested and then sent to the uh, attorney's office uh, because I would have no way of knowing and uh, if there was a, a public record request if at least my office was not engaged. And, uh, I do support the final stop being the attorney's office with you because they're illegal, but I, I think it should flow through, you know, I'm sorry, uh, and I should have said anything that pertains to our offices or our districts should go, th should, we should have that communication at the same time any department has the communication. I apologize for not being more clear about that. But yeah, anything that comes in pertaining to district or district request, I think, you know, we should be involved in that conversation um, um, on the front end with whatever department receives the request or whatever. But yeah, any, we should be aware of what goes on because we're gonna be supplying, often we're gonna be the ones supplying those records or making sure those records are complete, but then eventually landing at the attorney's office. But, um, um, but I, do, you know, I do think it also makes sense for even requests that don't, um, that don't go through our offices because they may have no pertinence to us um, still navigate their way through the attorney's office as well so that we can have one point person for our communications about just what is, you know, what is, what is going out. Oh, I, I agree. I mean, that's why we hire a lawyer and that's why our budgets increase year after year because uh, we, so Mr. Chair, 
So I can support that. Mr. Yes. Chairman, uh, from yes. our discussion this morning, there was um, there was a, a request of, of Debbie. Debbie, did we did we ascertain where that document leaked from? <laughs> leaked. I like that word. Well, I mean, <laughs> I, that's that's the way it was presented. Um, yes, we did, uh, sort of. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> sort of. Well, this will be good. Oh, you're gonna be good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, actually, the original there was an original request, as far as we can tell, uh, because it was then put into a spreadsheet in HR mm -hmm. back in April of 2019 for the information for all commissioners, uh, not just um, District 5. So that was sent out through the HR department. Uh, it had been redacted. We do we do show that that's been redacted. Do we know who it was requested by? No. Uh, it was an didn't. anonymous. It was an anonymous request. Um, I think it was an anonymous question. Via but, email? Via but we email? Did, no, we via? did not keep any records of the request. How so we there's got. no request of, <laughs> there's no record of the request, and it was anonymous. And right. we don't know whether it was email, phone call, or letter. Well, and, and, and may We're I We're not even sure the, the date that the request was made. They're basing the fact that there was a request on the fact that there was a document created on the HR drive that said in April of 2019 that has those documents in it. and. As best as the HR director was, you know, has been able to communicate, that document or that folder would have been created as the result of a public record request, which they think was a verbal anonymous request, but nobody has a record of, of when it was either. So, Steve, but if I may, Steve, 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 excuse me, Deb, verbal anonymous. So, so we know who, do we know who they call? No. So we really? don't know who, who they call, yeah. who answered the phone, mm -hmm. and who put it in. We Board don't know we, that. Um, we did have, oh, currently have a speaker. I didn't, it's not on my list. Well, but. But Mr. Chairman, with all due respect, I, I, can I just, Commissioner Yeah, Bain, I'm so just letting I, you know we had a speaker. That, that, that's fine. We're saying that someone made an anonymous request for a public record. Someone at the county answered the phone, and we don't know who answered the phone, and we know who called. We and that's a valid request. I don't. I don't know what other people know. I don't know. I mean, we don't know. I mean, we don't know what date it was or anything. I, it, Sometime in April 19. Oh, and that's based on the fact there was a folder created that contains those documents. Somebody that's what they're basing. The yeah. I, yes, you, for sure. Also, I, that, I that but maybe they're not no longer here. I'm sure that's the response sure. that they're no yeah, longer here. I'm not sure. Also, um, according to Jana, so prior employees, one was the benefits um, manager. The other one was what's called a HR records. Uh, damn, I forgot what they're called. Um, it, they're in charge of records for HR. But they did tell Jana when she came on that these records, they gave her a folder and told her that this, these, this information had been requested several times. So it had gone out supposedly several times, had not been. But we don't have a record of it. We have no record. Of the record request of, or the, res, or the, or the giving of the records. We don't have a record of either one of those. Well, what's been so, requested? But I want to ask this question. So was that, okay, you said a request was made of all the commissioners, of, of all the employees, of who, of whom was it the request made about that form? It, uh, all the commissioners? All the commissioners. Yes. Okay, and it's fine, it's a public record, it's fine, as long as it's redacted. But it would be kind of nice to know. I mean, yes. when people are requesting stuff about Steven or myself or Lumen or Robert, I think a courtesy call is in order, because I had, I had no idea until I heard it today mm -hmm. before the... Um, I agree. It's a public record, but I mean, obviously, uh, you know, sure. and we should sure. I mean, one reason I was so concerned this morning, I mean, I heard about it five minutes before I walked in. Right. I, you know, there was nobody could tell me who, you know, who supplied the, who supplied the records. You know, Allison, uh, you know, Madam Attorney certainly couldn't tell me that anything had been redacted through her office. So prior to, you know, this afternoon when I was told that it appears as if all the records were redacted prior to being released. Then, you know, this morning, I mean, I, I genuinely didn't know if they were just given and somebody else redacted before they put them online because it didn't go through the attorney's office. And, you know, candidly, that's where we can obviously run into a lot of trouble where we're trying to give direction to staff that, you know, we're trying to give direction to staff or asking, you know, especially, you know, if it's something controversial or whatever, we're interacting with staff that don't necessarily work for the board. So that's what, you know, from my point of view, that's what makes it difficult, uh, you know, about trying to run, you know, run down those, you know, run down that, uh, run down that path with folks that don't directly work for the board. Um, so, you know, commissioners, I, I did have a discussion this afternoon with, you know, with the uh, uh, assistant administrator that's sitting with the board tonight. 
we didn't know a whole lot more walking out than I knew what walked in, than I knew when I walked in. Um, I got some level of uh, comfort that the documents were redacted by someone before they were released or given out as a public record, so I guess that's good. I don't know who they were redacted by, we don't know that, and they certainly didn't go through the attorney's office, so. All right, do we wanna hear from the speaker? Sure. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Mel? Thank you, Chairman Benner. I'm sorry, I had, um, Anthony, I thought, had signed me up for, did you guys already go through the, uh, the benefits thing? Right. No, this is a different topic. Okay, you guys are doing the add-on before the benefits. Yes. yes. Okay, sorry. Um, Melissa Pino, 413 Southeast Bavillets. At this point, frankly, I wouldn't trust anything. Um, Commissioner Barry, really, why should you? And, you know, where's Alex Arduini? Because he and Commissioner Underhill and Jacqueline Rogers and a bunch of other people have been over on ECW disinformationing this thing to death. And I have really a lot of respect for Jeremy Basso. He's dead on on so many things and he's got a great record of advocacy in this community that far precedes anything that I've done. This is why that site is so dangerous, is apparently it's convinced him that metadata is not public record. Of course IP addresses are public record. This thing has been beat to death. When Janice Gilley announced her new process for public records, I immediately went, whoa. And I can't remember which and how many of you I communicated it to, but I know I did. She is going to centralize this so she can track everything. She wants her eyes on everything and she's gonna start gaming public records. And that is exactly what has happened. I could tell you gentlemen countless incidents where this administration is, is fooling around with public record, failing to fulfill them, cherry picking them. One of the, I'll give two examples. One of them is when Laura Cole dished off Matt Sullivan's letter to the PNJ and to WEAR. I got some text messages on it but I didn't get all of the public record, and I know that I didn't get it. Here's a more important, more serious situation. When I put in the code uh, uh, violations on Commissioner Underhill, I said at the time it was because I wanted to be able to more easily track the public record on it, and that's true. But I didn't tell the whole story, because the whole story is that when I originally contacted the code department to tell them that I wanted all the public records, the code department had to inform me that they couldn't do that because no, nothing had come to them. I said, what? They said, unfortunately, there, were, there was a code complaint that put in, got put in, that did not go to the code department. Instead, it got diverted over to planning because, of course, planning does handle the permitting portion of it. So, you know, immediately I realized what was going on, and so that's why I put that complaint in, because it never would have been processed otherwise, because administration did Commissioner Underhill the favor of not, pro that it's illegal. This is breaking the law when a citizen puts in a code complaint and administration just decides not to run it. So Mr. Arduini and, and Commissioner Underhill and all these people can play their games and get me kicked off Facebook today, Commissioner Barry, because I underlined that Alex Arduini might have your social security number now, and that's a dangerous situation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any further discussion other than, I mean, we've just said that we want the, um, any public record that involves the, the board um, to, to notify the office and also to go through the attorney's office um, for review. Yeah, and, and, and Jeff, the reason I support, I, and I'll second that motion if it's a motion for Commissioner. Well, I'm not making them, yeah. yeah. I mean, Commissioner Barry, I, I don't know, but, but uh, Jeff, for discussion, <coughs> it bothers me that tonight is the first time, Debbie, that I've known that this was a request in 2019. Right. Uh, we deserve that respect uh, to say that there was a public records request. Listen, our life is a public book. I mean, people can look up anything that they want on us. That's the price uh, that you pay when you go into public office. Uh, but um, there are certain things, as the uh, attorney alluded to today, that are confidential and private, such as 
your beneficiary, <laughs> you know, that goes on it. I mean, it's that simple. You know, I mean, you, have, you can have sibling squabbles. I mean, listen, I'm, I'm a product. <laughs> uh, and what? so uh, you, you certainly recognize that there are certain things of, of confidentiality that we deserve, whether you're the president of the United States or a county commissioner. And so that bothers me. And it bothers me that no one knows what happened. I mean, everybody hadn't left since 2019. Somebody was working here. I mean, no different than today of what you said today in our shade. Meeting. I mean, no one wants responsibility. We just push it all back. And for me, it bothers me. You know, if there's a public record of my office, we're not going to hide anything. We're going to submit it. We're going to give it. And we pay an attorney uh, to give us consult. And so it needs to go to the attorney's office and, and the office of uh, our attorney uh, should make a, a recommendation and uh, put her bar license on the line for everything that we do. And the other point from this morning, and I appreciate that, Commissioner May, and the other point from this morning that's very important, if these are being fulfilled without our knowledge, what if they're not completely fulfilled? Um, there are some records that, I'm, that I have alone that, that no one from the county has because they're on my own personal blog or my own personal Facebook page. And um, if I'm not told about a request, I can't fulfill it completely. And when that boomerang comes back, it's Bergash didn't fulfill the request. Well, I didn't know about it. So the, we've got to fix this process. It has, to be, it has to be standardized and it has to be formalized and it has to be most importantly followed. Commissioner, so that brings to light something that uh, the assistant administrator mentioned this afternoon because I asked if, if IT had been fulfilling public records requests on their own without any knowledge of the commissioner's offices. And apparently they'd been doing so by using keyword searches and things on our email server and that produces a certain number of results without telling us <laughs> uh, apparently not, uh, not without telling you what we try to do when they do those is run them for all for all five mm -hmm. of you sure uh, granted today we found that there might be well, we've been told you're saying you're saying that when you, you run those on all five of us we're told about she was about to say granted that may not be happening yeah right well, hell. we have learned that there is some more training that needs to be done but generally speaking in the process is is that we would sit we would send that information to you you your aides do have the same software access that the IT uses to do those code runs we should be going straight to you first not to IT and asking your aides do you want to do it would you like us to help you do it and Liz sure. has helped some of them do it we do have a process that Janice instilled after May of 2020 when we got my government online uh, we did find today, thanks to you know, Commissioner Barry's help, that we do have some more training that needs to be done, especially with certain departments. And just to answer, um, we do put, uh, when everything is gathered from all the departments and put back in the system, it is supposed to go to legal to make sure that we don't uh, disperse anything that's not supposed to be dispersed and obviously for the redaction. So what you're saying that it's been happening. It, it is, but since May of 2020, we have set up a process is Has it, the process been being followed? Is my question. We are probably finding that not always. Because so if my aide sends out a public record, I'd fire on the on the spot. Mm -hmm. Period. I don't care who my aide is. Right. If she sends out a public record request without bringing it past me, she'd be gone. Okay. And it's problematic to me if someone has sent out a public record request on me. I'm not going to speak for these other four guys on me without at least giving the common courtesy that someone requested that public record. I can't stop it from going out. I don't want to stop it, but we should at least be aware of it. It could be someone out there waiting to kill us when we walk out of this office. I mean, our lives are in danger every day because of our decisions. It could be somebody out there that has a crazy public records request and I can get in my truck and be killed. We should be informed. Absolutely, and as pointed out by the attorney after our conversation, Commissioner Barry, um, you need to look at, especially when we're talking about emails or texts or anything like that, you should be looking at them to make sure that all your personal emails and texts are taken out, which you are allowed to do you know, by public records law. Um, we have found out that we have some hiccups in the process. The process definitely needs to be refined. Uh, we're taking Commissioner Barry's suggestions, and I'd love to sit with any of the rest of you if you have some suggestions. Um, and hopefully and we train the staff that works, to, works on these. Okay, Commissioner Underhill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, from my perspective, um, Section 119 of Florida Code really articulates what our duties, what my duties are, as a uh, as to the extent that I'm a custodian of any records. Um, so, I like the fact that we've got uh, uh, my government online to be able to track these things. Um, that is uh, is very helpful. Um, you know, 
but I will say that I'd be very concerned about any process that we put in place that slows down the process or that gives me top cover with regard to 119. That's my duty. Um, that's the duty I swore when I took this job. And, uh, and I'll continue to con conduct myself in accordance with 119, regardless of what other processes may be put in place. Now, I think MGO is a great way to handle it um, and is, a, is a certainly a huge step in the right direction. Um, but this is a great opportunity to also talk about the, it, it, look, <laughs> I don't have any right to ask somebody why they want to know something, or and I don't have any right to ask who's asking, okay, because it's not my information. I don't own it. It was generated as, if it was generated as a result of my duties here, it's owned by the people. This, address, this really brings up the greater concern that I have with regard to public records. All of this information should be available to the citizens without having to query. Um, and it can be. We have the technology that exists that as soon as I create a document that in the conduct of my duties that is available for the citizens to review and see. Um, there's no reason to continue this practice whereby people have to pay to pick up their public records. Um, we can push it all out there and it's a, it's a basically it's, a, it's a, a, a knowledge management concept called data push, not data pull. You push the data out there and then you're, you, you don't have to worry about, uh, about you know, the idea that somebody's hidden something. That can be done with current existing technology at a lower cost than the cost of all of this manpower that's required to fulfill these, uh, these uh, public records requests. And again, every citizen has a right to ask for it anonymously. Every citizen has a right to ask for it for whatever reason that they want to. Um, and I certainly have no, you know, have no reservations about giving it. Now, once we put something into MGO, the work to compile it has already been done. And therefore, you know, charging somebody for it, first of all, that's problematic because the citizens already paid for my time or my aide's time or whoever's time to do that. They're already paying that every day. But it creates a disparity in that a wealthy person cutting a $500 check to pick up some data, that's, that may not be a problem at all. But to many of my constituents, that is a de facto barrier to their same access to that data for no other reason than the fact that they're not wealthy enough to pay $500 for a stack of papers. So, you know, we've got a much bigger issue here, and in fact, the issue that I think that we're, I feel like the issue of our own privacy here is a, is a small thing compared to the much greater issue of ensuring that this data is just available. Uh, there, it, it, would, it would solve so many problems if everybody's operating from the same data instead of you know, some people having actual facts, some people operating from whispers, that kind of thing. So um, you know, certainly interested in seeing any refinement of the process, but any refinements of the process need to be focused on making what we do here more transparent and more rapidly transparent and more equally transparent regardless of your socioeconomic class than moving in the other direction, which is making people fearful of asking for information. Commissioner Daniel, I, I can concur with you on uh, the, the access uh, of, of not being able to be charged. But to me, the fundamental question is, uh, there are certain legalities and legal things that should be redacted that none of us as lay people, or I wouldn't expect for you know the lay staff to uh, be knowledgeable of that the attorney office is. And so as she said, there are certain items that should be redacted, and that's the problem. I don't have a problem with any public records and give it to them, as you said, free of charge. That doesn't matter to me. But the problem is there are certain things that should be redacted. I mean, there are certain things on our financial disclosures, such as our Social Security numbers and Social Security numbers of our children, uh, that should be redacted in, uh, when it's put out. And so. Um, as she said today, there are multiple things, and to me, that's the question. If everyone has not taken the in-service or the training to know exactly uh, what's redacted by law, then that's fundamentally a problem. And so we have to have a clearinghouse of where every public record goes to make sure that we are compliant uh, to the laws. And so in terms of full access, I have no issue with that. I have issue with what should and should not be redacted, uh, particularly for the safety of not us, but for the safety of our families. Do we need to take a motion or? And Mr. Chairman, I'm yes. sorry. Um, I just wanted to clarify, will all public records requests eventually end up in the county attorney's office for evaluation for redaction or just all of them? All of just wanted to make sure I put that, that in That was my intent. Okay. I heard both, so I just wanted to make sure. That so or, or, as it relates to a commissioner or any public? 
or I mean, if, if a public record comes into a code enforcement, it's going to go through the attorney. I'm, I'm just trying I mean, to. I, I think that's, I mean, I think what code enforcement, whatever good for the commissioner is good for code enforcement. Code enforcement has a bunch of information in there. It's got pictures of people's houses. It's got statements made by people. I, I mean, I don't know what of that's private versus public, but we pay somebody that does know. So. Code enforcement, kids go to school like our kids. Yeah, I mean, you I, know, and people get very angry like they do at us with code enforcement officers. So, and, and I, I mean, we'll I think protect them some, as well. I think there's some value in having, you know, so just, and I know that you meant more things than code enforcement, I'm sure, but yes. just that one instance. Just say that I did have a public records request about a code enforcement case in District 5 that didn't personally, it didn't personally pertain to me, that property just happened to be in District 5. You know, maybe that's not something that I wouldn't be the custodian of any of those records, probably. I might not have been, I mean, there's a lot of code stuff that goes on that we're not even ever aware of. You know, I mean, cases are at the magistrate before I'm often aware of something going on. By the time it's at the magistrate, it's been going on a couple of years, maybe. So I know there's a lot of stuff that happens that we're not aware of, which is, that's fine. But at least if we're funneling everything through the county attorney's office, when something does come up in the future, I can, and they said there was a public record request done for this. I can communicate with Allison's office to say, hey, what, you know, you know, 123, 123 Johnson Street, what, what went on? What, what records were given? You know, what records were given to them? Just so I can see what the citizen is looking at because they'll call, they'll, you know, call or email us and say, I did a public records request and I got these things. But they don't show them to us. They just say, I got these records. Well, I, I, there's a very good chance I haven't seen those records. So at least I would know where to get them from Allison's office. So if we have one place we funnel all that stuff through, I think there'd be some value in that. So, Rob, I mean, do you well, think that there's some some public record requests are not put in the system? Or are, are they all put no, in no, the I'm system? No, no, I'm not saying that they're not put in the system, but I think that there's a... I'm, I'm asking. I'm not no, no, judging. No, no. I mean, I would ask Debbie, are all right, right. public no. record requests put in the system? No. They're supposed to be. <laughs> <laughs> so what we have found out today again that we need to some, do some additional training with staff uh, but they will be going forward so basically as we no, do, not all of them are being put in the system um, not all of them currently uh, so but I'm just going back I mean I get a um, I don't know if you guys get it a report um, and they only had a couple uh, departments highlighted but it contained 148 pages now granted some pages only contained one request, 148 pages of public records requests that have yet to be fulfilled. And some of those are from, um, I'd say a lot of those have to do with jail um, or with EMS, um, you know, so I, I mean, do we- I mean, I'm hoping all those are going through her anyways, because a lot of that stuff relates to litigation. I well, would, I, I, don't, I mean, potential litigation, those things specifically, I would hope. I, already I'm just trying, I, I don't know if we're adding like four people to, to, to the attorney's office for, tonight is, is my. For, ex no, we're not doing that. for example, there's a significant, I'll call it machinery of folks out at public safety who are dealing every day with insurance companies, with lawyers that are involved in these uh, accidents and the ambulance responses and the billing and all that. And those folks are quite trained in what they're doing and they are fulfilling all of those requests without usually them coming through us whether it be well, a, you know billing they, insurance they companies all that sort of stuff um, does some of it end up in litigation i mean uh, maybe that's how some of the it, once the case is litigated of course yes but i mean there's probably hundreds or thousands of cases where they're dealing with billing and and I mean, if they're doing, but, but still, and, and Robert, I understand what you're saying, but if they're doing the, the full preparation of them and then just ask for them to be reviewed. It, it would be monu a monumental task, I think. I think you're talking about probably, I, I don't even know, tens and thousands and thousands and thousands of, there are that there's, many there's staff that's yeah. doing that every day. That's what they do. There's a whole cadre of these folks out there and that's what they do is deal with mostly with insurance companies, but they're all day, every day. That's what kind of what they're doing. I, I would have to get all right, Well, let's, let, how, how about this? I mean, the board has taken action tonight. That's, that is my intent, but as other things, if, uh, you know, information comes maybe next week or the meeting after that or something, and they come back and say, you know, I know the board intended for this, but in light of this evidence, do you, would you consider having, you know, having only these certain requests that end up in the attorney's office that have any possible pertinence to your districts or something. 
based on numbers, if, I mean, if they're, if they're saying that there's thousands of these things, maybe yeah. that's different. But based on, based on what's going on right now, so, so I, I'd like to leave the motion as it is. And if they come back and, you know, after Allison and, and whoever has an opportunity to, to talk about some of the numbers of requests that exist, and it seems like an insurmountable number, then I'll be the first one to say, okay, you know, what I, my idea wasn't very good. It wouldn't be the first one. So I'll say my idea wasn't very good. Let's, let's make an adjustment to it. I think right now, the software that we have, you, you could get alerted every time there's a, a public record request. I, I mean, right. I, not, I, I, I understand you're, you know. That's not really what I'm talking about. We're, we're talking about the, once the compilation is done, having them be screened out of, uh, with somebody out of Allison's office. I'm not talking about the, when the request is made. I'm talking about when the, when the compilation is done, having somebody from the attorney's office put their eyes on it. And may I suggest this, is that if they're not being, and what we can do um, is make sure that they're trained by the county attorney's office in the jail especially, because Rich did just text me that they get a lot also, and EMS, that they are properly trained and that we do some spot checks on them on a continual regular basis. But let me get back and find out how much, and, and what the see volume how many is. a lot is. Look, the people have yeah, different I'll references for what a lot means. Is yeah. it 10 a month? That might not, I mean, that might seem like a lot if you're in that department, but that may yeah. not be that big a number. Yeah, and I, I don't know what the numbers are. All right, we'll get the numbers. And, and, and Debbie, you know, and, and Robert, I, and you've just made me aware. So, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, we don't want to bombard our legal department with 10,000. The problem is the policy, Debbie. Uh, what gives a person discretion of which ones we send to the legal versus which ones we don't? Well, now, right now, the process that we have, uh, Hope, and we'll be I mean, we, that, that can be discretion of, 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 of a staff person says, well, I'll send this one to legal. I won't send the other one. Or, well, I don't really trust legal to send it to legal. I mean, who decides and what's the criteria for what I send to legal versus what I don't? Because I agree with the chairman. Uh, 10, I mean, it's just you can't send 10,000 public records requests to the attorney. Correct. But right now, the processes that go through, uh, yeah, not jail, not EMS. I don't know. So jail that. automatically doesn't go to her EMS automatically. That's the standard. That, 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 no they, jail, no EMS goes through right, the attorney. Right, they, they handle their own. So you get no email, no, Allison, you get no jail and no EMS. Allison, wasn't it a HIPAA thing when we discussed this when we were setting up MGO? Um, I, I won't say that we get no. We, we tend to get a lot of questions, but not necessarily stacks of documents. I, there is a staff of people at EMS that's trained in dealing with billing and uh, that sort of thing. But what I'm saying, Allison, is, is the policy is we don't send EMS a jail to the attorney's office, or is that the discretion of the person that can send it? And so it's either we do or we don't. I mean, that's not great. That's black or white. I mean, there's a policy that you send them to uh, the attorney's office or a policy that you don't. So what's the policy? The process I'm, I'm is on. that we do not. And, and so, okay, and that's fine. Yeah. So they do not. So you don't get them. T typically, no, we're not getting those unless well, there's a specific. If there's a specific question, we might get yes. Oh, we might get I would say asked. sometimes there's an intent to sue or an intent for right. for some type of legal action. Okay. In which case, I think that would go through the attorney's office and 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 you know. Got it. Got it. So. If they think it's going to be a lawsuit, they send it. Well, usually an, an attorney, I mean, they... But who makes that decision? Does it go to the chief or does it... Well, does it usually the, uh, I mean, from what I've seen from on an insurance side is that there's a reservation. Of, I mean, the, there's some type of, of, of statement from an attorney saying that we feel that, that there was an issue that occurred on such and such date. I am representing this person and I would like all this information. I think that, that seems pretty clear that, that there's probably... Uh, something coming down the pipe that we need to notify our insurance carrier and and the county's attorney office needs to get involved. Well, Some that, of it, you know. Yeah, I'll get the numbers for you from the different departments of how many there are, so you can appreciate what the volume is, and then we can move forward from that. But at the moment, the process is for uh, I will say normal uh, public records requests. We do have, everything goes through the attorney after we have collected the information from the uh, different departments. And we are right now supposed to send them all through the attorney for redactions, for personal information, or anything else that can be, that should be removed. So everything is? It's supposed to. And so. Except, uh, but, but the jail stuff and the EMS stuff is not. Correct. You mean everything else? Correct. The, the, so not everything. What I call regular else. public records requests. Okay. All yeah. right. Uh, 
Mr. Chairman, um, perhaps, perhaps the outcome of tonight, if we can just uh, maybe I'll amend my motion if my colleague would amend the second to ask that anything pertaining, you know, anything pertaining to any of the districts, we have clear communication and, you know, certainly want all of those things going through the county attorney's office. And if you put a discussion on for the next meeting about some of the numbers about the just broad number of public records requests, a lot might seem like, you know, uh, uh, you know, 10,000, I, I doubt we're getting 10,000, I mean, uh, but if it's, you know, if it's 500 a month, that's a huge number. If it's 10 a month, that's maybe not a huge number. So if we could see what some numbers actually are, I mean, I don't, I don't think any of us, uh, you know, I certainly don't, and, and you know, I, I know uh, all my colleagues well enough. I don't think any, anybody is opposed to, to uh, has any issue with the public getting the records. Um, I don't think that's, that's, you know, the times that I've had to fill public records requests, I've never charged for my time. That's my, you know, as, as my colleague from District 2 mentioned earlier, his time's already being paid for, my time's already being paid for, so I've never included my time in, in, in anything. Um, so I, I, and, uh, and I think that exhibits this level of everybody understanding it's part of our gig. But, uh, but I do want some type of narrow funnel as to where before they, the last bastion of, of influence that the county has before something goes out, that it's seen by somebody that does report to the board if it relates to us. I think that's reasonable. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm fine with it. All right, that's the second then. Yeah. Okay, any further discussion? I'm sorry, Commissioner, could you restate the message or the, the motion? That we clarify and, and define the fact that anything related to our offices are, first of all, going to be uh, shared immediately with our offices before the compilation of data is completed because we're a part of that compilation of data if it, if it pertains to our districts and anything also pertaining to our districts be funneled to the county attorney's office before it's, uh, before it's released for her, for her purview um, with, again, her being one of the two employees that we actually oversee. Yeah, okay. Uh, very supportive of the first half, can't support the second half, but thank you for the clarifying that. Thank you. Okay. Any further discussion, please vote. Motion, motion passes 4-1 with Commissioner Underhill in dissent. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Would you mind taking on number two? And as I stated uh, earlier today, I was gonna go out at five and go out at seven and I'm about 15 we, minutes we, behind. We've already we dropped, dropped it. it. Oh, I'm, okay. Yeah, we dropped, well, you weren't here, so we <laughs> oh. dropped it during the, um, okay. Okay. Is there anything else that I, I would need yeah, to Yeah, I, mean, I, I mean, we've got some discussion items. Number two, returning the, the annuity program? Yes, sir. You Could want to go ahead and take that? that? I mean, just okay. I, I want to be here for the discussion and well, I think I'm going to leave. If that's okay, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Do we want to take item three related to the to the county administrator's contract as well? That may not be a tremendous amount of discussion. Sure, we do have a speaker. Okay. Okay. Jacqueline Rogers. You have a three year contract with the administrator. This happened with Jack Brown and I came and spoke for him too. We spent a lot significant amount of public money and I believe the current administrator was actually added to the search by uh, one of the commissioners. Uh, it sure does look like it's retaliatory that it was added later to, you know, today to the agenda because she's trying to protect the public citizen. I, I, right here in your contract, it says the administrator has a significant work and public service history in Escambia County and state government, including serving as county commissioner, deputy chief of staff of the Florida House of Representatives, and the policy director for a Florida governor. You guys selected her out of all the people. You guys flip administrators so frequently, it's ridiculous. And who's gonna con wanna come and work for us? Do I always agree with Ms. Gilly? No, I have some serious disagreements. Maybe I don't have all the information. I've never taken the time to sit down and tell her where I disagree. Um, I, you know, I, I think some things should have been changed. 
But that's beyond the point. You have a three-year contract, you're gonna spend more money, possibly. I don't know that's what you're gonna do. Maybe you're gonna renew your contract. I'm just hoping you don't do that. Same thing I said for Jack Brown. We should just continue the contract. You can reevaluate it at the end of the contract. She can reevaluate it at the end of the contract. But in light of this unmasking of the citizens and all that stuff, it sure looks retaliatory that it was added on today. So thank you. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Commissioner Berry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I did ask uh, Madam Council to add this as a discussion item. Uh, and all I'm asking uh, my colleagues to do is to support uh, putting the contract on a discussion for June 17th uh, board meeting and, and take, up, uh, take up the item then, especially um, you know, with uh, Madam Administrator not here tonight, just sure. you know, I've got no intents of uh, no intents of a, a lengthy discussion about it. But would ask my colleagues put the contract on the agenda for the 17th, and then we'll take up all the discussion then. Is that a motion? That, that's that's a motion. That's what I'm asking the board to do. Second. Yes. Okay, Commissioner Underhill. So, with the understanding that the uh, as, as Commissioner Barry just said, um, you know, there's never a bad time to talk about. Uh, you know, these things amongst ourselves. So uh, if one of us wants to have something on the agenda for the, such a discussion, then it's appropriate uh, to the extent that it is nothing more than scheduling this for discussion. Uh, thank you. Yep. And I think, um, it, you know, in the contract, it does state that there's a, a review uh, annually. And I think we were coming up on that that time. I know I was asked about uh, about that review uh, not too long ago. So. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, we did miss the review last year, and I, I think the administrator did seek the review, and we didn't do it. I, so, I, mean, we, I had mine one on one. I thought yeah. she, I thought she did one on ones. Yeah. So I don't know if we did them. it publicly here. So yeah. I, mean, I don't think we did. I believe the yeah. decision of the board was that we would do it all oh, individually. Probably. Okay, uh, yeah, right. and I know that I, I did mine as well. So, okay. Thank you. So, all right. Any further discussion? Please vote. Motion passes five zero. Uh, we're going to, um, uh, Commissioner May, can I, I just, um, we didn't have an issue with, with cap one. Can we go ahead and take that? There are, are there any speakers? There are no speakers on that. Move cap one, uh, A, B, and C. Second. Sorry, that's. Cat, I'm sorry. Cat two. Two, one, A, B, and C. All right, sorry. Yeah, we'll go ahead and take those. I'm sorry, the release of mineral rights. That's yeah, hold on, about. sorry. One second. I was on cat one one. I apologize. Okay. That's what I was going for. Sorry. Oh, which one no, no. are we doing? Oh, we're doing the mineral, mineral rights. rights. Mineral rights. Okay, so. <laughs> yeah, we discussed it this morning, and it's my motion for A, B, and C. But at zero dollars, correct? Yes. B, okay. Not a sec my second stands. Discussion. Commissioner Andrew. Thank you. Um, Madam Assistant Administrator, um, just to reiterate and get on the record, it's been determined by the staff that there is no public <coughs> interest in maintaining these mineral rights. Is that correct? <laughs> I, I, I said, as I said, if we thought there was, we wouldn't have sold it. Yeah. So the property we're became actually required by previous law to maintain those minimal rights. Yep. I mean, we should at least have done, I would think that we've had done the rigor. Mm -hmm. No, it's the default under Florida law that we keep them. Okay. Uh, and Chips, you're saying that you have not reviewed any of these mineral rights? Okay. Okay. Chips, based on your probably drive by knowledge on it, 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 could you come to the podium, please? I need to hear a staff member tell me there's not a public interest in maintaining them. If that is the if that is the case, please let me know. Do you, do you know of any public interest in maintaining these mineral rights? I know of none. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chips. All right. Please vote. <laughs> Motion passes five zero. Okay. Cat two dash two now. We have three speakers. Sure. All right. Uh, Melissa Pino. Thank you, Chairman Bender. Melissa Pino, 413 Southeast Boblets. Staff has the same problem with the PRRs that the commissioners do, and sometimes they don't go through the system because they don't trust that administration is fulfilling them. Um, on the annuity program, 
I really wish that I could support this for you gentlemen. I do, because I recognize that it's a ton of money. And I can't imagine the frustration that's boiling over at this point um, due to some of the mismanagement that's happened under the last two administrators. Uh, I know how it feels because the mismanagement of the county cost my husband and I a quarter of a million dollars in a lawsuit that should have been handled better by management than participating in that lawsuit. Should have been handled by somebody sitting Dr. Edler down and telling her it was a really bad idea. But that suit would not have run so far. And so I know how frustrating this is. And I just want to say that um, per Jack Brown and, and Janice Gilley, HR has been a mess for different reasons. Because under Mr. Brown, he had you guys siloed off so badly and he had this county top down so that, for instance, the directive to Mr. Turner was that he wasn't supposed to talk to you gentlemen directly. And a lot of directors were told that if they got caught speaking to commissioners directly, they were gonna be terminated by Mr. Brown. It was, a, it was a bad problem, and that's when things really got to be a mess because Tom left the county because of it. And then we got Eric Kleinert, and we all know what happened then. That's when the real mess started. People say to me, why do you even read ECW anymore? You know it's garbage over there. And I say, because I read disinformation sites because they need to be corrected when there is disinformation being put out. There is a problem when there is no commissioner signing on to this benefit from Marie Young all the way to you, Chairman Bender. And why didn't these directors know uh, about it? Why were people getting advice out of the HR department? Because we all know that that was happening. And HR is not financial advisors. They are supposed to give the information. It's obvious, I, I mean, this, is, this was such a no-brainer for every commissioner, and yet somehow every single commissioner didn't sign on for it? Of course not, because it's quite clear you were getting advice from, from, from HR not, not to do so, right? And I'm gonna state again, whatever Commissioner Underhill has to say about this, He's not eligible for this benefit, so he, he can talk until the cows come home. Now, I would have figured if he was eligible, he still would have done that. He would have thundered and boomed, and he would have forewunded it, and then he would have gone off and grabbed the money on the sly if he could have. So, you know, the disinformation needs to stop. It only hurts discussion of everything. And what's sad is that, Doug, when you bring something nice and then you say, contact my office, why would anybody contact you, even for such a great program, with what you've been doing this week? Thank you. And Jacqueline Rogers? Jacqueline Rogers, 1420 Ridgeway. Obsession is a, is a wonderful thing, huh? The same base pay for 21 years for your firefighters, but you guys get 49% put in your account. I have a copy of the document. I did ask publicly for these to the attorney. She's very nice talking to me, but I didn't get those information. When I asked for the retirement stuff net, now I find out tonight, since April 2019, you had it. I got a bill after 22 days and no response. I said, where are those, where's my information? I get a bill for $481. When it already existed, it was already given to this anonymous person, probably to the anonymous employee also. You, you're charging me for pages and flash drives and all this stuff when it was already available. To the, the thing that was posted, redacted on a Scambia Citizen's Watch, it's a document. You can have a different opinion, but documents are here. The document says right in here, for Commissioner Barry is the only one I've seen. I've not seen the other documents because, again, I did not get them. To withdraw from the Florida retirement system to participate in a local annuity. And it says you are declining participation in the FRS. Your decision to participate in a local annuity plan is irrevocable. As long as you hold a position eligible for the senior management service class, you must be a local elected fisher, official for this option. <clears throat> Excuse my voice, I have a cold. So the elected class had this option on here. He didn't check it. It's on there. PNJ documented that this was brought up before the board. Commissioner Barry voted on it. I do not know what the other election forms say yet. The paper documented this is a 1.9 million expenditure, but you have fire trucks that don't have AC in it. 
If you could listen to the calls, Broadcastify is the app, PulsePoint is the app for your EMS and your fire, take some time, see what they're dealing with. And commissioners in the elected class, I mean, you get more than the senior management at 27%. How could you in good conscience tell us we don't have enough for fire, for fire um, houses, for, uh, for raises after in 21 years for your base pay? with all those positions empty, and you guys are gonna vote for this for yourself? Yeah, you take, you take advantage of it, you find it out. This has to go at the state level, obviously, but I, I think you guys should not do this. It, it's horrible, who's going to pay for this? It's county that's going to pay for it. And you tell us we don't have the money for this, we don't have the money for that. And, and then you're gonna vote for this for yourself. And how was this done anyway? If all this information, did you say you didn't even find out how much it would cost before you go get an ethics opinion? Th those things, that was, it wasn't done in an official capacity by the attorney. I'm sorry, this is a bad look for you and I think it's wrong. Maybe not ethically by legal standards, but ethically and moral by most people that I talk to. Thank you. Thank you, Jacqueline. Brian Cairo. Brian Caro, Cantonment, Florida. Um, we have a saying in public service, especially with uh, fire and EMS and feet on the street, as you will, strive for 25. We strive for 25 years to get a retirement, put our lives on the line, going to people's houses, doing things for them on their crappiest day. I find it kind of sickening and disgusting that there's a reach back for something, a decision. I don't know all the facts yet, but I'll have them. I'm conferring with some people. Are the other employees, such as Feet on the Street, offered this 401A annuity as well? I don't know that. Somebody does know the answer to that. But I guarantee you, if I were to ask about the reach back for the money that I missed out on, I'd probably get run out of the office. $1.9 million. That's two fire trucks at, at minimum. And yeah, you might hear, well, they're riding around with that AC. Well, that's no big deal. It is a big deal. I don't have time to sit here and explain it to you why it's a big deal. But the deal is, worry about the feet on the street, the people who are making this county safe, the people who are protecting its citizens day in and day out. I appreciate the job that all of you do. I know it's a stressful job. Ms. Commissioner Benners, you spent some time with Squad 3. They were entered twice during a meal. Yeah, we signed up for it. I understand that. But you're paying these guys ten seventy nine an hour coming in to put their lives on the line for strangers, the citizens, visitors to this county, and it's disgusting. You need to really evaluate what you're fixing to decide to do and find somewhere else to put that money back into public safety, back into whatever that serves the citizens of this county. Thank you, Brian. Board? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and uh, I, you know, I appreciate the uh, appreciate the item getting added to the added to the agenda for discussion. And uh, and uh, recognize my friend from the News Journal, uh, Jim Little. I apologize for not getting back with you last week when you reached out about you know some some quotes for the uh, you know for the article about it. And um, you know, we've talked a lot over the years. You've been there a number of years now, and uh, I've always been. I think you know. Uh, very cordial and friendly with you and you know but I've also been clear I'm never going to uh, you know give you uh, I'm never gonna do an interview with you or give you quotes about something uh, related to my colleagues which I never do um, and also about something controversial that hasn't come to our board yet um, you know I no matter how good of an idea or poor of an idea I can't accomplish anything without you know without being able to get a couple of votes up here and um, you know especially when I've asked to bring something forward that, you know, I'm, uh, you know, I'm aware is going to be is going to be controversial. I feel like I owe it to you to uh, uh, to bring my, you know, to bring my conversation to you. That's the, uh, you know, it's it's your, it's your support, it's your votes that um, that I need to, you know, be successful with my ideas. And um, so just along those lines, that's the, you know, that's the only reason I didn't, uh, you know, try to wage, <laughs> try to wage a preemptive battle. 
in uh, you know in the news journal about the item, um, you know I wanted to I certainly you know have uh, you know some issues maybe with uh, you know with the way uh, the way the uh, articles put together, but um, I wanted to save my discussion for here with my colleagues again. So one of the things. Um, that Commissioner May and I have, have talked a lot about since being elected is fairness and equity. And uh, you know, we talked about it in dozens of instances about number of different number of different items over you know the eight or nine years. I, after finding out about the issue, and, and there's a lot of backup, and you know, part of that go you can see where they uh, when I became aware of what the terms are related to the program, you know, was in the October, October 2019 timeframe. So, uh, you know, requested at that time to, you know, to be able to opt out and, you know, participate in the program. And, you know, that was denied because it wasn't within six months of taking office. There's a, there's a time limit for our participant, for the elected officials participation. However, the senior management class participation, there is not a time frame for that. They, uh, they could elect to opt out of FRS and into this program at any point in time after they become eligible. So there's no time frame you know, uh, tied to their service, just once they're eligible, they're eligible. So uh, you know, over that 18 months or this 18 months time frame, I've tried to figure out how to, you know, how to be able to bring the item forward. Um, you know, I did go in March and, uh, you know, wanted to get an opinion from the Ethics Commission about my ability to even bring the item. Because if, uh, you know, if that discussion had gone differently, there, we wouldn't be discussing it tonight. There would be no news because I, it wouldn't be something that I could even bring up. But in this instance, it was found that I, that I could bring it up. Um, you know, so it's, it's me over this 18 months that has you know, tried to navigate this path and, and we've ended up here. But there is a, you know, there is a much larger class than just myself. Um, the class does, the, the potential class, you know, does include four of our colleagues, and that does include uh, Commissioner Underhill. There would be, you know, there wouldn't be his, uh, there would be limitations on his participation immediately, but in the future, those limitations might be different if, if at any point in time he's not in FRS and he took the same path that other employees could take, which would be convert from pension to investment, and then once you're not a part of FRS anymore, then he would be in the same class that four of us are in. So he, and I understand, is, is, is not wanting to do that. that that's, that's certainly his right. But it's the four of us, you know, outside of Commissioner Bender that are in that class. But the larger, the much larger pool is, you know, the dozen employees that, um, that would also be eligible. And, you know, unfortunately, a number of them have been eligible for a long time. You know, many of them 10, 15, 20 years and um, didn't, you know, weren't made aware of any of the, any of the details of the program. Um, as, you know, Ms. Rogers brought up, you know, she brought up a couple of forms, uh, you know, or one form that Commissioner uh, May and I filled out. So I haven't seen Commissioner May's, but I presume it to probably be checked the same as mine. Um, and, you know, it's a one page form that says, you know, says, uh, uh, you know, the potential to opt out and participate in a local annuity program. You know, candidly, I did ask. Um, you know, I have 22 years experience as a certified financial planner. I've had dozens of clients that have retired out of FRS, very familiar with the investment and pension programs. No familiarity with the 401A. I've never done work for any elected official that participated in it. Um, candidly, I've talked to many elected officials uh, since the item came up in October of 2019 and have yet to find one that was aware of it other than the one former board member that, that, took, that uh, participated. Um, so it does say that, and I asked, w what does this mean? You know, well, what exactly is this? Well, it just means you're permanently not an FRS anymore. Oh, okay, I guess I don't want to do that. No, nah, probably not. Okay. I mean, so... And then the item in 2016 where we voted on an extension of the contract for ICMA, ICMA, which is the provider of the 401A program. Um, if you go and look at the backup in the contract, it's a, you know, it's a very legal document. Um, but there's no reference to these tables. There's no reference to the disparity in employer contribution. Um, where it talks about contributions, there's two asterisks that say contributions are based on FRS tables. 
a reasonable person would read that and presume that the contributions would be the same as your FRS contributions. That's what a reasonable person would assume by reading that if they're not given any other information. Um, you know, so we've got the issue as it relates to a number of us, but like I said, there's a larger number of employees that, that may have been eligible for years and years that didn't have, that weren't informed of the, of the terms of what the 401A actually meant. And, um, you know, just the existence of the program is not being reasonably informed of what the benefits are. It's the employer contribution disparity that is so great. Um, you know, going back to, to Mining Commissioner Mace, you know, uh, begin, uh, beginning of public service, it was about a four multiple for the employer contribution disparity. There would be about four times it going to the, uh, to the local annuity program. That number has grown to about a six time disparity. Uh, along those years, the senior management numbers have correspondingly been about four times, you know, seven, eight years ago, where they're about six times the uh, employer contribution now. And I'm not stating that any of my colleagues would, are going to pursue this or, or want to. I'm not stating that any of those uh, senior management employees are going to switch to the investment plan or maybe in the investment plan, I don't know, but if they're in the investment plan and then they're eligible and they want to opt out, I'm not saying any of them are going to choose this path either, but they should have the right to make that informed decision on their own, not have it made for them de facto by not being informed of it. That's not fair and equitable to me. Um, you know, the, the value of the plan, it doesn't, there's not any increased expense to the county for participants in the plan. If we have, uh, you know, currently, uh, Commissioner Bender or, or, you know, in 20, late 2018 or 2019, I'm not sure when you enrolled, but, you know, back to the data when I found out in 2019, Robert was the commissioner participating. I don't begrudge Robert. I, I applaud him for participating. That's great. He was aware of the employer contribution disparity. That's, that's great. Um, that's a long time frame from 1997 to to him to have one kind of participant as a, as a board member. Um, and, you know, there's a, there's a rule with FRS that if you're, a, you know, if you're receiving FRS retirement benefits, then you're precluded from participating in another FRS in program. So the likelihood would certainly be with that former commissioner that, that they were forced into this because they could not elect one of the FRS options because they were already drawing FRS from their previous, from their work career. So I just, I really, I think it's just a fairness and an equity, uh, an equity thing. Folks should have the opportunity to base it on their situation and you know, their, their families, what they're comfortable with, and they should be making the choice with all the information that's provided to them. Um, you know, that being said, there's not any of those senior management people that have urged me to do it either. I knew that I might would, uh, you know, need a, uh, would take some criticism for bringing it forward, but still back to the fairness and equity. I think it is fair and equitable for us to have this discussion. I think it's reasonable when you see, when you understand the employer contribution disparity parts of the program, you understand why Madam Administrator, each one of her hires that has been eligible is participating in the program. Every, every one of them just like Commissioner Bender. I don't begrudge them for participating in the program. They've been made aware of it. They see the value in it. They see this disparity. So they jump right into it. Um, you know, the plan's been in place 25 years. More than half of the total participants that have taken part in it have enrolled in the last two years. So it just tells me for some reason, unknown to me, we didn't, We've not done even an inadequate job. It almost feels as an intentional job, but I don't know what the intent would be. Like I said, it, there's, no, there's no difference in the expense to the county. Commissioner Bender's salary is budgeted the same as ours. His retirement previous to mine and Commissioner May's participation currently, uh, Commissioner Bender's budgeted expense to the county was the same as all of ours. So there's not any additional expense to the county. Why in the world would 
uh, was it not something that was used as a recruiting tool, made, made, made uh, very aware to people? I'm, you know, candidly also disappointed that since the issue, you know, since the issue has come up, you know, towards the end of 2019, and we have had, you know, nine or ten of uh, uh, Administrator Gillies hires get into the program. I'm disappointed that we still had those 10 or 12 previous and existing employees that were eligible that weren't brought in and notified, hey, look, you were actually eligible five years ago, but you're still eligible now. These are the terms of the program. You may or may not want to do it. You may have too many years to, for it to make sense to you. And I realize that, you know, every, you know everybody's situation is different. But that doesn't seem fair and equitable to me either. They should have the opportunity to assess whether they participate or not based on the best information that's available. And I feel like that's been a responsibility that the county has had that as a county, we have clearly failed to do even if it's just the, um, just the non-attention to it. You know, and, and maybe there was no intent. I don't understand why this wouldn't be seen as such a great thing that they would be excited about telling you, hey, something you don't know, Commissioner, you're actually eligible for this now. And you were looking at participating in the investment plan. There's no additional benefits to the investment plan. And if, you'll, if you look, if you consider opting out and looking at this, your multiple is going to be this. That is what you would hope would be the intent when you have directors that become eligible for it, you know what, congratulations. You just got a raise, and now you're part of senior management class. You're gonna be eligible for this, uh, for this other retirement plan that, um, um, that, again, doesn't cost the county any more money, your participation. But these are the terms of it. You may or may not wanna take a look at it. We're not here to give you financial advice, but these would be the tables that you would be due if you did participate. Why don't you take a little bit of time and think about it? I think those are, in my opinion, I think those are very fair and equitable things. Again, no staff, although the staff number of people that are potentially eligible is much larger than ours on the board, none of them, you know, push me to do it either. I, I think it's fair and equitable, and I appreciate you guys, you know, taking up the discussion tonight, um, you know, regardless of how, how it goes. And again, you know, I apologize, Jim, not getting back with you last week, but as I said, you know, over a number of years, I would hope we've built a relationship where you can understand, um, you know, those two parameters. I want to save, I want to save my, uh, you know, I want to save my content and my discussion for my colleagues who I'm going to be asking for their support for something. So I'll try to do the best that I can to answer questions and, um, uh, and see how the discussion goes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, at the, I mean, I've, I've been read on with a number of corporations over the years um, as a consultant, and uh, where there's benefits, uh, it, they always say the same thing. In fact, I was just read on recently and say, said the same thing 20 times in one Zoom meeting. It is not the employer's responsibility to give financial advice. It is not the employer's responsibility to give financial advice. Now. Um, it is the employer employee's responsibility to ask the hard questions, to think through these things. Uh, <laughs> Commissioner Bender, I think I read somewhere that it took you five months to make a decision. Um, that's the appropriate behavior of a uh, of an employee uh, properly looking after their their interests. Um, the idea that really that I'm having the biggest struggle with here is that if an employee, any employee in the county, has an issue with the way that their benefits were handled, there's processes for that within the county. Um, you know, file your complaints with HR, work through HR, come up with a, an appropriate uh, 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 resolution. If you're unable to come up with a resolution and you believe that you've been wronged, you hire an attorney um, and you, you know, plead your case. And when you plead your case, it would be appropriate that the county would plead its case to the contrary. The struggle that I have with this event is the first that I ever heard that we were having this discussion was when I saw the video in front of the Ethics Commission in which there were a number of material misstatements of fact, uh, not the least of which was that the speaker was speaking on behalf of, of the other four commissioners. In order to make that statement, you would have to have come before this board and we could have had that discussion. Uh, I don't know that it would have gone very well, but I mean, the appropriate time would have been long before a trip to the Ethics Commission. Um, if we are in dispute, uh, between an employee and the county, 
it's the county attorney's office to responsibility to stand for the for the equities of the people of Escambia County. We're talking about a, 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 a get right, uh, a couple of different terms that have been used of, uh, of, of uh, making people whole uh, for decisions that they made in the past. There is no making it whole. We're talking about a settlement where we have no legal case to settle. There is not a documented dispute for us to settle. And in order to have a settlement, you would have to have a documented dispute where the parties on either side would be able to articulate the facts so that we find out if there is, in fact, a, uh, a, a getting right that has to happen. Um, I don't think that that's even remotely what has happened here. And I struggle with the idea that, it, certainly if we want to talk about whether or not somebody was informed or not, that's fine. But the idea that there is a need to uh, make somebody whole, where those dollars would be coming out of the general fund and going into the pocket of a commissioner, whether it be me or any other elected official, uh, is, is beyond preposterous to me uh, and something that uh, simply cannot imagine that we are at that place in our society. Now, obviously, I have fairly libertarian leanings on these things and don't believe that we should be entitled to any benefits of our office after the last day of service uh, to include any kind of retirement. Um, well, obviously, that's you know, not very popular, and, and you know, <laughs> as long as, I guess, the people that are making the laws are the ones that are benefiting from them will continue to have that. Um, but uh, the, uh, there's just no way to make it right to take cash out of the pockets of the taxpayer and put it in our pockets, um, first and foremost. But secondly, it's insane that where we talk but on this day, as every day almost that we meet, we talk about uh, the, the disparity between the haves and have nots. How do we have such a lucrative deal only available to the most senior people and certainly only and, and you know, uniquely available uh, to elected officials as we vest very, very quickly? I think the only appropriate action of this board tonight would be to eliminate this perk that is that only supports and only benefits the most senior uh, among the public servants here, including ourselves. If we're truly leading from the front, the appropriate motion tonight would be to eliminate the 401 Alpha um, and put us at the same playing field as all of those employees sitting out there from the person taking out the trash up through the directors and department heads. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any other discussion? No, uh, Commissioner Barry. And when you, when you say equity and fairness, that's what I believe. I believe it should go from the custodial to the commission uh, in, our, in, in our service. And, and I applaud you for being courageous enough uh, to first to make sure that it's legal uh, and it meets the guidelines and, and which you follow that protocol. And so uh, I never would do anything or support anything that's not ethical and not, that's not moral and not legal. And so uh, unfortunately, uh, many others would have their opinion, uh, but those who dedicate their life to public service deserve to be compensated whether you're working in a community center or whether you're working in parks and rec or whether you serve as the board of county commissioners and so quite frankly in my opinion this action is not about county commissioners uh it's about those employees who have uh, have served in, in the dark uh without knowledge of this program and that they should have the opportunity to exercise uh, any retirement benefits, not for themselves, uh, but the sacrifice that they made for their children and those they may leave uh, upon their death and their retirement. So I will second your motion if that's a motion. I'm, I'm certainly at some point in time going to move items A through G, but I wasn't sure how the discussion would go or what would be, you know, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'll and, wait my turn certainly. But. Yeah, and, 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 and I get it where you're at, and I have a lot of questions, and I've been speaking with the attorney a lot. Um, because I, I, when I was brought in, I, I try and think back to when I was brought in uh, five years ago, you know, it was a pretty quick process. You go in um, at that particular point. Uh, I, I don't even remember who she was, but it was a, one of the staff members. I don't think she's here any longer. Um, and I got a package of paperwork. And when it came to the retirement plan, um, I was already in the FRS program. I was already vested because, you know, I had 10 years in at that point. And when I got in, to the FRS in 2006, the vesting period for me was six years. So, um, you know, I had 10 years in. 
Um, I was vested in, in the pension plan, which is a very generous plan. Uh, most companies don't offer them anymore, so I had I had no idea, and uh, you know I knew about the FRS investment plan. I just didn't think it was that great, and I liked the idea of a, you know a fixed rate of return at the end, you know when you finish your service. So, um, but I will say this: that I I have no memory of anyone mentioning that plan to me. Um, sitting at ten years, I had the pension if I wanted it. I could have potentially put it on hold. I don't know what my options would have been because I, I wasn't told. So my issue is, Robert, you're a smart guy. And you came on you know, a couple years after me and you did your homework and kudos to you for that. But you know, in reading the paper, and it took you a long time to, to find out. I mean, I'd like to know more about that because Stephen wasn't told, Lumen wasn't told, I wasn't told. Um, setting aside the argument about is it too generous of a benefit? I mean, you know, setting that aside, Folks, you know, that are working here for a, a decade or two decades um, who were never told about it, I think that's a disservice. Um, again, the, the cost associated with funding their pension through FRS or their investment plan or this plan, um, they're the same. These are the, these are the contribution rates that we make to the state. So if folks were not told about it, you know, I want to know why. I mean, I don't have a time machine. I can't make that right. But I want to know why, and I want to know if it was on purpose. Because if it was on purpose, I mean, uh, Robert, how did you find it? You took five months to make the decision. How, how did you find out about it? Tell me your experience. Five months. I did mine in five minutes. Because I didn't know there was a, a 20 or 30% or 40 or 50% return option. Maybe I would have made a different choice. Tell me about your experience. Sure. So I, um, during the onboarding process, um, they gave me the paperwork. Um, and, uh, and so I started doing my research. I didn't know if I wanted pension or FRS, uh, you know, this is, this is my, I'm doing this full time. I don't have another job. Mm -hmm. Um, about fell out of my chair when I showed what the County was, was putting towards retirement though. I'll, I mean, I'll say that I had no idea that was occurring. Um, but it is set by the state. It is not something set by us. Right. Um, and, um, uh, and so as I started going through the, the paperwork, I found the, the charts that I think some people have, have seen now. Um, and uh, reading through that, it, it shows on the back the amount. So the first page shows um, <clears throat> the employee and the employer contribution rates for each class. Um, and then on the fourth page, it shows uh, for the investment plan, um, which was when I went through uh, when I went through FRS on their website and I did their questionnaires. They said that the pension plan. Uh, was not the right fit for me that I, that I would like the investment plan. Mm -hmm. So in looking at those numbers, it showed of the, the percentage on the first page, how much of it hit your account. Um, and so I, I asked HR about it and they said, we believe that to be true, but you needed to contact FRS, contacted FRS. And I asked them, I said, page one shows this, page four shows this. And is that true? And they said, yes. Um, I'd also say at the time, uh, H, the information that HR gave me was that um, the, there was not a commissioner rate, that it, or there's not elected official rate, that I would, I would be at the senior management level. But they were wrong. Well, I, I didn't know that. So I, I, but still, what the senior management was. At least, at least you got paperwork. Right. They're a packet of paperwork. Well, I mean, that's, that, 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 might have, that must have changed over a six year period because there was no packet of paperwork and there, you know, can't. I'm sorry, yeah. Robert. And so, um, and so I, I said, the, uh, yeah, the, I'll take the senior management level, which is, I think about 24, 24, 26 at the time. Um, and, um, and then they, you know, five months in, they, they make the change. And then shortly thereafter, we have to start pulling together, like I, like I got in the mail yesterday, the financial disclosure form. So I had to log into the account to see, uh, the, the balance and um, and I noticed the contributions and I, I thought they were high. And so I, I contacted uh, uh, payroll and said, I think you're, you're putting in too much. I was told that I was making this percentage and you're putting in this percentage, uh, at which time I was informed that the board had previously um, in the last agreement uh, stated that they, the contribution rate would be the same as FRS. So that, that's how it came about for me. 
Well, I mean, that's an important thing to know because uh, it sounds to me like Lumen and, and Stephen and myself, it was a pretty quick deal. And, um, you know, and for me, my, like you said, everyone's situation is different. I came with some time accrued already. So for me, it made, I mean, 50% per year, I don't know. But it, it just seems like uh, I, I didn't know that. But the pension for me, you know, I believe was the right option. So I wasn't going to look too hard behind it. But for someone coming in new like you, I'm glad you found out about it. I'm glad you know about it. I just, I feel for people if they were not told, if they were not told about it. And, you know, I read cover to cover this, cover to cover. You put it together, emails, hearings. The only two questions I have are, um, obviously I see that they've ruled that based upon what they were told, um, you can vote on it. I see that. But I, I just have to ask the attorney, is this legal, what's contemplated? It's a very basic question. Is it legal? It, it, it appears that it is legal. Will it invite scrutiny? I am I didn't sure. ask that. I don't care about that. Is it legal? Is it, it legal for us to make a payment of this sum to employees who were, who were apparently purposely not told about a plan that was very generous, that can affect the Im impact their families going forward, their retirements? And I don't, I don't give a, I don't care what, what people think. I mean, I agree with what Stephen says about fairness. If I'm told, look, if I'm told and I make the, the proactive choice to stay in the pension plan, that's one thing. But if it takes five months to find the information, it's still not right. And then, oh, by the way, you luck into something and it's, it, it just doesn't seem right to me. So again, I read this and it looks like they can vote on it, but is it legal? For the county to pay, make that payment that's a very important question that's why whatever happens tonight Stephen, I'm, I'm certainly not prepared to make any firm decision tonight i want to know that it's legal because here's the issue if we if we make this vote and we you know and, and you guys get back payments and other employees who are entitled get back payments and it's challenged in court and it's found to be unlawful or it's, it's found that we've made a mistake i mean then there's ramifications for those of us who voted for it so um i want to be supportive it's a hell of a lot of money. And I, I'm, I'm angry that folks weren't told about it. Um, it's not right. And you can complain all you want about, you know, we don't make the rules. These are all set up by the state. The state sets up pension. You know, if people want to get lathered and worked up about it, they need to look at what highly compensated elected officials make in drop. You want to get lathered up and exercised. These are all programs of the state. We run for office. And it's what you get. It's part of the emoluments package that you get. Setting aside, you know, what people want to get ups upset about. Um, but I got to know that it's legal. And I don't have a warm and fuzzy that it is. Um, Stephen, so. so I, I, I think tonight, the con tonight's conceptual about being able to move forward. Any actual resolution, you know, any resolution is going to have to come back to the board. It's not a one, it's not a one item thing. Yeah. And, you know, that's the, I mean, you, you mentioned that you were angry. I, you know, over the 18 months have probably gone through a, uh, uh, a, a number of the, 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 uh, the, the stages of grieving about the issue, <laughs> meaning, you know, you know, denial and anger. And I mean, it, so yeah, I have, I've certainly had those, had those same feelings and, and, you know, candidly, I, I, I never, um, like I said I, I took it on myself to bring it forward, so I would, I would never, um, you know, try to draw anyone into into my discussion, as I've never tried to draw any of my colleagues into something that you know was my problem necessarily. So I brought this forward. Um, that anger issue, that exists. That exists among a number of people that would be in that pool that had no idea what we were talking about even as of two months ago. So that 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 emotion does candidly exist and I think it exists in my opinion it exists rightfully so it would be this would be just the opportunity to um, to have people put you know put what that delta might be to their situation if they wanted to pursue it that dozen or so employees and any of the board members that would be you know that would be wanting to do that this allows them to uh, reasonably take the time to try to figure out whatever that delta um, 
you know, and the phrase was used, lost earnings. Um, you know, candidly, it's not earnings. So this is not earnings. This is, this is just simply principal contributions that mm -hmm. would have gone in in a disparity, you know, in a, in a, you know, in a, in a method that had a lot of disparity, in my opinion. Um, so it, it's not any degree of earnings, simply principal contributions. But this would allow any of that pool of employees or board members potentially mm -hmm. to take some time and look at their specific situation and see if it's something that they would like to pursue. Then any of those would come back to the board for another for approval. Decision. But but uh, again, I you know, Stephen, I I don't even know if I you know, like I said, this is a this is a big decision to make because obviously we've all invested time in in our service, and I'm in my 15th year. And again, um, you know, you make a mistake up here. You know, there are consequences. If, there, are fo there are elected officials around the state, not even, a, you know, charged with a felony, have been removed from office and stripped of their. Well, uh, I, I would say, you know, I mean, we are certainly in these public meetings, and we we're in our, you know, we're on, we're in our degree of public service, and and uh, you know, we have a, you know, we have a general counsel that provides advice to the board, mm -hmm. and um, that when the board takes the advice then you that provides the you know provides the cover legally for the board that's the that's the rationale of having an attorney's office um and you know what i would ask is there's no way that moving forward conceptually is gonna that doesn't breach any legal issues and you know in between the time of now and when the uh you know when a res when the first you know resolution may come back before the board um we can certainly ask based on the discussion tonight for Allison to try to pin down a more firm a more firm answer for your question and, and because candidly I don't have you know that's why I went to the that's why I went to them proactively um, you know I've got no interest ever in being you know in being investigated by the ethics commission or having you know complaints filed against this complaints filed against that certainly have no in, intention of uh you know doing anything that causes me any legal trouble as a commissioner mm -hmm. um you know i think that's some you know something that uh you know something that i have you know taken a lot of pride in well, so i want to get to another specific issue before and i appreciate where you're at stephen and, and like so I, say, I agree with you i've got no intention of ending up getting removed from office for a felony voting on something like this and and in some period of time we can, you know, we can ask Allison to pin down that before something comes back. I would, I would, I would feel much more comfortable doing that. And then the other thing is, uh, when I read the ethics, the various ethics opinions, the one issue that I did not see was, um, you know, the issue of when you, when you onboarded and you and you check the box for you know the FRS investment, you know, it did clearly have that other option down there. So. Were, was the ethics committee appraised of that? Because I, it seems to me like they were led in a direction that there was no knowledge whatsoever. I'm playing devil's advocate here, because we got to get it right. Did they know about that form? I certainly think so. I don't, I, and, I didn't. And here's the reason yeah. why I think it's problematic. You have the form, but the form also says a local annuity plan, if available. So if they didn't tell you about it and they purposely hid the ball from you. I mean, I, I don't know that the form means much, but I, did they look at that? That's the, that's a critical question. I'm, I don't know if Allison can answer that. I'm not 100% sure. I presume so. I know that I know that we talked about it because you gave me the copy of my form immediately upon me finding out about the other plan where it said I elected it. And then, you know, one of the first things I said was, well, you know, um, these public, I mean, these offices, these terms of office, are not, uh, you know, the terms of office are nothing that's guaranteed. You know, we should have had, if we were elected in 2012 and did paperwork in 2012, if that automatically kicks me out of, you know, kicks me out of it because I did paperwork, I, there was no guarantee I'd be reelected in 2016. I should have had more paperwork in 2016. Every time we're elected, that begins a new service, a new term of office. That's why we're re-sworn in, all those things. There was never any, I, I, won't speak for Commissioner May, but I know that I was never given another HR packet or any, uh, there was no other form filled out. The only form I've ever filled out based on, you know, pertaining to the FRS issue was in 2012. So hypothetically, if that precludes, a, you know, a term of service and I should have had another form to fill out in 2016, which I didn't get, then there's no form 
based on your kind of question. So maybe that narrows it to just the second term. I, you know, and if that's, uh, you know, if that ends up being the answer that maybe comes back, okay. I mean, from my point of view, the, like I said at the very beginning, the fairness and equity, that's what this is about to me. And, you know, it's, it is a few of us, but it's not just us. There's a much larger pool of employees that this pertains to. And for, I feel like I owe it to my children. I owe it to my family to pursue what a reasonable person would have chosen if given the information. Yeah, absolutely. There's no question. If someone tells you you get 8% or you get 40%, I mean, come on. But, but obviously people weren't told. And now here's, that leads me to my next point. I'm, I've received a phone call today from a former commissioner who said, I was never told either. I want my money too. So what, is this a can of worms? Is there a four year um, uh, statute of limitations? Or does this open up a can of worms for every former commissioner, every former employee? Allison, that's a question to you. Is there a statute of limitations or can former commissioners now come back and, and get, get money. I'll certainly let her answer that about the statute of limitations. I will say the question before the Ethics Commission was, mm -hmm. and please correct me if I'm wrong, but it was limited to investment plan. So, the, so that's why anyone, whether it's a board member or an employee, um, anyone that would seek any type of resolution would have to convert. If they were in the pension plan, they would have to convert to the investment plan and then opt out. Mm -hmm. Or if they were in the investment plan, they're already there, and then they would just opt out. So if that whoever, and I'm not, I don't know who you spoke to, but if it was a former commissioner in the investment plan. He, he was. <laughs> okay. Well, he was. I mean, so that, is there I, a statute of limitations, Allison, on that, of four years? It would, well, uh, four years for a tort, five years for a breach of contract. I mean, it would just depend on what kind of theory the person was attempting to travel under if they were wanting to file a lawsuit. Who, okay, but who would they file? They would file a lawsuit against whom? Uh, that's a good question. So, I mean, there's a, the lot county, of, there's a lot the to provider, unpack I mean. here. Stephen, and, and, and I, like I say, I want to be supportive of you and Lumen, but I want to do it with great trepidation. I want to do it with a written, op written opinion from you, Allison, that this is legal, this is lawful, and we can do it. Not an attenuated, uh, you know, disclaimed, um, something from a board down south. I, I want to hear it. I want to read it from you. And I, I'd like to have some, some statutes cited as well. I mean, I don't mean to be so direct, but this is a big decision. And if we get it wrong, it will be challenged. It will be scrutinized. And then we can find ourselves, those of us who have put 15 years in, losing our pensions if we do it wrong. So, absolutely. I mean, I, I understand what you're saying. I, I respect it. That's how we end up in the discussion today rather than October of 2019. Well, because I, you're just trying to figure out how to possibly even navigate it because it is a, it is a. You know. So, so Allison, can, can you put together, I mean, you're a very intelligent government lawyer, a, 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 a written opinion that this is lawful. This is legal for us. Cause I think there's prob I, there could be problems with it. Back pay for uh, officials, public officials. I mean, some might say it's compensation. I mean, I, I don't know. Um, but I, I, I just, I'm not at a comfort level yet, Stephen. I want to be there to support you guys. I'm angry uh, that I wasn't told about it. I'm angry for all the employees who were not told about it. And I'm, I'm frankly disappointed. And it, for him to take five months to, to, to solve it, um, I mean, good on you. You were tenacious. And you're getting 49% on your money. God bless you. The rest of these guys are getting 8.34%. So... And Jeff, and here's the point, and, and, and as we said earlier, and, and I can concur with you because I, I think that- We gotta all, get it right. You gotta always make sure that it's legal and it's ethical and, and, and it's moral. Uh, but it is an issue of fairness. I mean, the 49%, unfortunately, when people keep throwing up that number, that's the same percentage that you pay the FRS. Amen. It's no different on exactly. the bottom line to the county. Uh, it's how the money's being reinvested. And quite frankly, when you look at it, FRS is taking a lot of money, but what they're doing is they're paying the retirement of people down. I mean, that's what they're doing. It's like exactly. Social Security. Social Security. They're taking your money to pay that. And this is a, a, a risk. Uh, I can't speak for Commissioner Barry, but when I signed up, I, I, I certainly 
didn't sign up to say that this would be a, a career. I signed up for the investment uh, and the intake person highlighted what I checked and I said I want to be in whatever is the short term uh, investment. And the truth of the matter is uh, the intake HR person was negligent in conveying that information. Um, I think that what Commissioner Berry has on the floor, Jeff, I agree with you, uh, that this has no compensation for all the people that had the disservice. There are people who gave 25, 30 years uh, to the county to find themselves having to go get, you know, another job, <laughs> you know, and maybe uh, this would have fitted their uh, performer and portfolio uh, much better. Uh, I'm seconded Commissioner Berry's motion I'm, I'm, I would stay to it but I would um, accept exactly what you're saying uh, that the attorney gets an attorney general opinion she gets consult from another attorney put it in writing uh, before before you know I mean because this is just the discussion of what he's what he's brought forth I mean before there is you know and I feel very comfortable with what he's brought but I don't think I could agree with you, but no compensation for all of those um, employees or any commission until she can come back with that. We've gone to the ethics board and we go to the next level because true transparency is where we ought to be. And so I would support Jeff uh, directing the attorney to get us an, um, another opinion, a, a legal opinion along with her opinion. Steve, you wanna make a uh, amended motion that we can support? So, I mean, the motion would be A through G and add, I mean, A, it would be A through G and add that nothing comes back to the board until, you know, until Madam Council is able to procure, you know, procure a written statement saying that it's legal because if, if that, if, if that comes back and says it's not, then nothing comes forward ever. Because and I would prefer to get that first before we take action on this, Stephen. I mean, uh, really, I really am on the edge of my comfort zone. And, and again, I want to be supportive and I will be supportive, but it has to be, has to be legal. And I really think we need to, to seek that opinion. And I want to clear up whether or not this ethics opinion was based on, you know, the knowledge that you, that you had filled out the enrollment form as well. Um, and I didn't get that answer. It I honestly don't remember definitively, but the, the question to the Commission on Ethics was asked from the perspective and on behalf of Commissioner Barry's perspective and his question was, I didn't have enough information. And that, you know, there may be pieces of evidence like the 2016 um, ICMA contract. I mean, we didn't take absolutely everything to them and, and play out all the documents that there were the question was we didn't have enough information we weren't informed not that there wasn't the existence of a plan just the the information robert mentioned getting a packet that included tables and stuff right i, mean, I didn't see any tables there were no tables no in that. i never did either that, i know, never did either. what you do is you you leave it as a as a layperson would would presume that if something doesn't reference this disparity in contribution rates, you would presume it's the same contribution rate, well, except here, you control it. That's here's, to me, here's one of the most disturbing things of the whole, of this whole issue now that we're, that we're ripping the scab off and looking at it. We just fought through pretty tough reelections. I know I did. And I didn't hear anything about this from HR. Yet, apparently in 2019, it was known to you that the only way to make this change is within six months. So thankfully, the attorney reached out to me, Allison Rogers, in uh, mid to late March and said, by the way, you're on a clock and here's a bunch of paperwork. And I appreciate her doing that because HR didn't do it. HR didn't do it and administration didn't. And now I find out every single one of them is in that plan. They knew. But why didn't they tell us? Why didn't they tell us? That's what I'm mad about. That's what you should be mad about. But set, stepping back from that, it doesn't matter how mad you are. I'm not going to do anything illegal. I won't do anything illegal. I won't do anything unlawful or unethical. So that's why I'm kind of torn on this, Steve. I, I want to support it, and I will support it, but I need a lot more comfort level um, before I do so. I would greatly uh, prefer and recommend that we not take action on this tonight, that we get what we've requested from the attorney first. It, it, you're in now, right? You're in. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. 
we see what you're thinking about. Let's get all the facts. And then, look, I won't duck out of this room. I'll make the vote if it's the right thing to do. But I got to make sure it's the right thing to do. I'm not going to give up 15 years um, that I've put in. Sure. Thank you. I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, I guess I'll withdraw the motion on the floor um, and we'll, we'll try to procure, try to procure a, uh, a more definitive written agreement. You know, that is, I mean, that, that was the intent of going, you know, to the Ethics Commission in March to, uh, to try to cross that bridge to see if there's even something on the other side first. But I, you know, I, I understand what you're saying, and there's not, I mean, there's none of us, you know, even, even you know, colleagues I might disagree with at times, and there's none of us that have any intent of doing anything, especially taking action up here that's, uh, that's illegal. Um, you know, if there's, uh, you know, if the intent is that hypothetically you can support it based on, um, you know, based on the, uh, the, the forthcoming written opinion that says it's legal, then, I'll take that. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, like, uh, I've mentioned it a bunch of times up here. I mean, you know, I've got eight, eight nine years on the board, and and have been, you know, fortunate to, uh, you know, fortunate to, to, for the most part, garner support from my colleagues. And it's, um, you know, it's because I try to read the room and and and, and work with folks, kind of give and take for what, uh, you know, for what folks will support. And um, and Stephen, that's not going to change going forward. It's not going to change going forward. And believe me. You know, I now there's an article out already, and I'm taking a, I'm taking a bullet. I didn't even I didn't even opt for this plan, and I'm getting beat up for it just for saying I want to make I want to be fair to people and make sure they're they're whole. This newspaper is a dis disgusting joke, Jim. It's just a disgusting, despicable rag. I'm getting beat up. I'm trying to do the right thing for people who were not told purposely, not told, disgusted with this newspaper. What a joke. Well, and, 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 and Jeff, uh, you know, for me, and we'll go to, to the record, and I applaud uh, Commissioner Barry for bringing it forward. It's really not about the commissioners, but they are senior people who don't have the ability to have this microphone that feel, that, that feel like they can't voice that they feel like they were never given the opportunity. And so even if it came to a point where commissioners or elected officials didn't and, and staff was properly compensated, you know, I, I would feel good about it. I would too. Um, and, but what I do believe is Commissioner Berry say, what's well, fair for all, you know, I'm never gonna fight for something. Uh, you know, it's, it's always a thought that you know, we should make sure that we look out for everyone. I mean, I think that everyone should be given the opportunity uh, for their years of service uh, to be compensated properly. Uh, and there are some, some people who are just uh, left out. And I appreciate your position and your honesty. I mean, uh, quite frankly, uh, missing my son's basketball game is worth much more than any compensation I could have gotten. And it's held me here all night. So money can't pay me for the time I miss with my children. So, Commissioner, if, you know, we don't take action, I mean, I believe Madam Attorney's got direction to get a written legal opinion about the legality of the, of items in this instance, legality of items A through G as they were presented and see if that's a legal course of action. Yeah, that's I what like you're that. asking. All right, that's, that's good enough. Okay. Commissioner Underhill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think we'll, um, yeah, I'll go ahead and make my comments. I'm sure it won't end up getting very far. but. Um, we say that in the military, if you want to get people to do push-ups, as a leader, you st get down on the ground and start doing push-ups. You don't order them. Um, and that's a principle of what's, you know, what's good for, you know, you lead from the front and what's good for uh, the leader, uh, you know, he it eats the same food as everybody else, that kind of thing. Um, if the 401 alpha is so great, which obviously it is, is there any reason, um, and the, I'll make this to HR and to the legal, is there any reason that we don't make this available to every single one of our employees? I it's state, state law. State law. Because the general idea under state law 
is that if you are going to be an FRS participating agency, which Escambia County has been for decades, you're required to have all of your people be members of the FRS unless they meet one of the very few narrow exceptions. That's which, an ex okay, and, and that's, this. thank you. I wanted to get you, <laughs> I'd, I'd rather you say it. I'm not sure I could get it out of my mouth without spitting. We are cause, forcing every single one of our employees to pay the exorbitant overhead of the FRS, except us. If that, if you're- Doug, speak for yourself. I'm not in this program. No, no, except us, us, the senior people, okay? Whether it's you, I'm not in it either, uh, and, and would not be in it, wouldn't have, ch wouldn't have chosen it, wouldn't accept anything that is not good for the, uh, that's, that's not the same as the people we lead. It's just wrong government when you make such a sweet deal available to us, us, the, the, the uh, privileged class, but not available to the guy that takes it out the trash every day. Commissioner, candidly, you may or may not be aware of it. Your contribution multiple to your, to your pension plan is also five or six times the regular employee's contribution multiple. Uh, I'm obviously very aware of it, Obviously, Stephen. Obviously, <laughs> but, it, but you want to be the same as the employee but you're obviously where you're actually accruing a six times higher pension benefit than they are. And I'm criticizing the state okay. practice that forces us into that condition. And, 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 and the reality of it is, Commissioner, is the 49% is the same thing you would pay at FRS. It, it doesn't cost the local citizens any more money. Uh, it's not something that county commissioners or anybody have established. It's the same thing for state legislators, state senators. It's the same thing for judges and all those who serve in an elected position. And, and quite frankly, at the end of the day, when you really analyze this, it is uh, a bargain in terms of tax dollars because it's a gamble on longevity of life. Uh, when you take this investment retirement, you get your lump sum. If not, if you go into FRS and you get it, it pays you or your spouse uh, in perpetuity until death, and this doesn't pay into death. And so one of the reasons this was implemented, and I say, is because it certainly saves taxpayers' money in the long run. It's not, I mean, that's unfortunate. If, if, if people have misconstrued it uh, through any other form of media or, 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 or social outlets, that this is uh, adverse cost, it, it is not. It's actually the reason it was implemented is because it's a savings uh, to the taxpayers long term. Okay. Uh, last item for the uh, tonight is the county attorney's uh, for action one dash one. Bender. Yes, ma'am. Before we close this item, I'd like to say a few things. As the comptroller of this county and somebody that holds the checkbook, I have reservation in fulfilling a vote that you would have to back fund a pension. You are here with accusations that you were never told, and I sit in a seat to have to believe you and spend taxpayers' dollars. So you're gonna put me in a difficult position. The position that your attorney is gonna take is she's going to tell you, is it legal for you to vote on this? She can't program your ethics or your morals. She's gonna stay legal. Then I need to independently, I answer to Governor DeSantis and I answer to the people. I am really gonna to have to look at this closely. I am not comfortable at this time to back fund a pension for the commission or for the employees. My second point would be looking at that contrib contribution rate to ICMA and finding and reviewing a net benefit rate. Um, the conversation that I hear is that it's the exact same amount that the county pays, but ultimately we're talking about the benefit that is inured to the individual. So the rate that you pay FRS is deducted heavily for admin fees, et cetera, et cetera. So the net rate that goes to employees for or anyone in FRS is this tall. Mm -hmm. The ICMA rate, the way it is written in the contract that came to this board or a commission board for approval, is giving the gross rate of benefit to those select folks in the senior class management status and to the commissioners. So Pam, let me ask you a question. Mm -hmm. 
had we not gone through this entire conversation before you chimed in at the end and voted to pay Commissioner Barry his back pay, are you saying you would have given the same due consideration after we voted? I was going to speak first. I didn't think it was proper for me to speak first to tell you that okay. I am probably not going to be comfortable if you all vote to back fund. What if Allison said, what, what if I Allison know? finds uh, statutes and, and uh, precedents that it's legal? Again, I don't answer to Allison. Okay. And I don't answer to the commissioners. I answer to the people and I answer to Governor DeSantis. Well, I do too. <laughs> and so I am going to review the opinion that she creates for you all. And I'm, I appreciate the fact that you went this direction Absolutely. instead of, yes, sir, instead of making a vote to move A through G. So I like the way you went. And I will be glad to work with Allison on any collaboration and do some research in what I can find. I hope you understand that mm -hmm. I don't like having to even think about this. It's, it's a terrible thing for us to be put into, but I don't like the idea that people were not told. And for anyone to think otherwise is ridiculous. And, Robert and I, is a brand new commissioner. We've got an 8% or we've got a 40%. And it took him five months to figure out. There was, there was something going on and people weren't told. Former commissioners weren't told. Former employees didn't know. That's the problem that I have. And we might find ourselves in a lawsuit. I don't know where this will land or where your vote will go, but I do want to have the conversation with you that at this time I am not comfortable with it and I hold the checkbook for this county. Just thought I should let you know before this discussion ends. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Um, cat 1-1 one one is, uh, I'll take it just a, it's the, uh, uh, A, B, and C, this is related to the incident on the fishing on the pier? Fish, yep. Motion. So moved. Thank you. Please vote. Motion passes 4-0, Commissioner Underhill off the dais. Anything else for the good of the whole?